Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name's Will Strong. I'm co-president of the board of Northwest Children's Fund, and welcome to our 12th annual forum. Uh, we're thrilled that so many of you have joined us for this important conversation on community trauma and child well-being. For those of you who are new to Northwest Children's Foundation, here's us in a nutshell. We got our start over three decades ago as a public foundation, which means we raise money from our community and invest it back in, specifically to break the intergenerational cycle of child abuse and neglect. We do this in, with two complementary programs. First is through our grants. We make strategic grants to agencies working on the front lines with children and families who deserve our support. Since 1986, we have invested over $17 million to over 300 agencies and many of these partners in the room right now. Our second program area is educational outreach and convening, like this forum. We know, like you do, that there is power in bringing together a broad cross-section of the community like this to learn together, connect with each other, and build working relationships. Now, before we get the program underway, I wanted to share four useful tips for the day. First is the slides. So you'll be seeing a lot of slides in, this, in the presentations, and we will be providing them to you in an email after the event. So of course, feel free to take notes if you'd like, but know that you'll be getting the slides afterwards. Um, breaks, we're not going to have any formal breaks, um, but feel free to grab a cup of coffee in the foyer uh, or go through those doors. You'll see the restroom. And if you need to get up and stretch your legs, of course, uh, feel free to do so whenever you need it. Questions. If you have a question for our presenters, please use the question cards on the table. Write your question down, hold the card up like this, and one of our wonderful volunteers will um, come find you. Question, there's a question basket also in the back corner that you can use to submit your questions. Uh, for our web stream attendees, please feel free to submit your questions through the chat function. Um, and then our feedback surveys, they're very short, and we need every single one. Your feedback is really important. We use that um, to figure out the program for next year, so please submit those. If you include your contact information, you will be entered in a raffle and have a chance to win some really cool prizes, including Dr. Jen Wright's book, a signed copy, and also two free tickets to next year's forum. Um, the feedback forms are in the programs, on your tables. And for those of you online, you'll find the link to the survey on the Sessions tab. And finally, we couldn't put on a conference like this without our very generous sponsor, sponsors, and I'd like to give them a shout out right now. At the premier level, to Primera Blue Cross, a very special thank you, and the Thomas V. Giddens Jr. Foundation, thank you for your enduring support. At the benefactor level, our gratitude goes to Washington State Department of Children, Youth, and Families and Kaiser Permanente. At the leader level, Committee for Children, thank you, Joan Duffel and team. And at the patron level, thank you, Haggard Child Care Resources and Seattle Children's. Your par partnership means a lot. Thank you also to our volunteer sponsor, Heritage Bank, our media sponsor, Parent Map, and to our four webstream sponsors, Alaska Children's Trust, Wenatchee Valley Medical Group, Chuckanut Health Foundation, and Matsu Health Foundation. Thank you. And thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, now I have the pleasure of introducing the esteemed uh, Executive Director of Northwest Children's Foundation, Victoria Helm. Hello, hello. Thank you each and every one of you for joining us today. It's thrilling to see so many of us here together to think and talk about how we can create the optimum environment for all children to lead their best lives. This is a remarkable gathering. We're a very full room today, a sellout crowd at the Washington State Convention Center with hundreds more joining us by web stream. So who's here today? Who is this community? Let's take a look. First, geographically, we have people here from across the US and even some from beyond. People from 116 communities in 22 states, 
from Alaska to Florida, from Maine to Hawaii. A special welcome to all of you joining us from out of town. Here's another illustration of who we are. We are over 900 individuals from more than 240 different organizations. We are teachers, parents, therapists, first responders, child-serving agencies, and we come from government, nonprofits, the medical and legal fields, foundations, universities, and more. This mix, this multidisciplinary nature of this gathering is really important. If we are to build an equitable future for all children to thrive, we've got to work together. We have to reach out beyond our everyday silos. It's vital that we build our collective knowledge, share our different perspectives, and develop connections across organizations, professions, and sectors. We believe, as I'm sure you do, in the very real power of collaboration. At Northwest Children's Foundation, as elsewhere, our work in ending the intergenerational cycle of child abuse and neglect has been strongly influenced by the groundbreaking research on adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs. The ACEs research shows that child abuse and neglect, along with other trauma such as domestic violence, mental illness, and the incarceration of a parent can lead to very high levels of stress in children. Toxic stress affects brain development, increasing the risk for serious health and behavioral problems throughout life. The greater the number of ACEs one experiences, the higher the risk in adulthood for problems like homelessness, chronic unemployment, substance abuse, as well as the continued cycle of child abuse and neglect. For many years, the ACEs conversation has been focused on this individual or family trauma, represented here by the leaves and branches of this tree image. What's been missing is the discussion of the other ACEs, adverse community environments, represented here by the roots and soil. Adverse community environments include inequities like systemic discrimination, a lack of affordable and safe housing, community violence, poverty, and more. This tree illustrates the relationship between the adversity within a family and the adversity within a community. This dual approach, taking to account, into account both ACEs, is the foundation of our discussion today. So here's a quick uh, note about today's program flow. We'll first hear from Seattle pediatrician and healthcare leader, Dr. Ben Danielson, and then from Dr. Sean Ginwright, our keynote speaker. Then we will move to an informal discussion, a uh, panel discussion, and Q&A. At that point, Karen Andrews, principal of Interagency Academy, and Sheila Capistani, strategic advisor with King County's Best Starts for Kids, will be joining us. And now, the program that we've all been waiting for. Dr. Ben Danielson is someone who is well known in our community as an extraordinary pediatrician and community advocate. He experienced the foster care system as a young child and credits his amazing single mom for his appreciation for the value of education and a passion for advocacy. He's been affiliated with Harborview, Seattle Children's, and since the late 1990s has been the medical director of the Odessa Brown Children's Clinic. Dr. Danielson believes that health is more than health care, and any health care provider who strives to improve health must be active beyond the realm of their medical practice. As noted in the Seattle Times, quote, he pours his passion into improving the health and circumstances of low-income children and families both inside and outside the clinic. I have the honor to present to you Dr. Ben Danielson. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Wow. I kind of wish every one of you could uh, stand up here for a moment and see this audience. It's such an honor to be among you. Some of you I know, 
and many of you are new faces to me. It makes me think that that's really um, one of the obvious and, and incredible strengths of the Northwest Children's Fund is that it, it has this capacity to bring so many different people together. I hope today, as you hear these conversations, as you're part of them, as you soak up this kind of energy that you're, um, you're kind of thinking about, not only how incredible it is to be around so many people, but also how incredible it is to be around people that you don't normally spend time with. And I'll take it one step further, and I hope you hear things that you don't normally hear, that you open yourself up to um, maybe embracing a bit of discomfort, being uncomfortable about things you hear, and then pondering them and thinking about them and considering them. I hope you'll even take it another step and think about this group as a network that you've created, thanks to Northwest Children's Fund, and that you will take the conversations that you hear today and expand them, continue them, continue them through the contacts that you'll uh, be receiving of everyone here and the opportunities that you have to sit in a cafe, in a space, and just continue to discuss these issues because they're not the kinds of things you figure out in a couple of hours with a couple of talking heads talking to you. It's the kind of thing that you, you live, you breathe, you take in, you consider, you challenge, you challenge yourself, and you continue on. Can you make that promise, that commitment? Because I think that's going to make this a meaningful day, at least. Thank you. All right, I get to ramble to you for a few minutes. Um, last year, I had a, the honor of being here as well, and then uh, the organizers made the mistake of not deleting my name from this year's, um, <laughs> so I get to be here too. I almost made a big mistake. I was uh, downstairs and about two-thirds of the way through my presentation and realized it was Canacon, and uh, <laughs> I thought people weren't quite as engaged as I thought they'd be, but I had lots of smiles and stuff, so it felt good. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about just how the, uh, some of the experiences I've seen have framed some of my thinking around these topics today, but I don't want them to be the, the framings that dominate your thinking because there's so many different ways to have these conversations and think about these issues. But I do, I just want to share a little bit of the way experiences in our lives shape our feelings, our thoughts, and our ideas about the world around us and who we are within it. I talked to a lot of students and um, folks who are entering into the healthcare field, and mostly what they want to hear is about the exciting ch technological changes that are coming to healthcare, how uh, things like CRISPR and the ability to paint cancer cells are just going to transform our ability to promote health and wellness, how there are going to be nanobots that will be crawling through our bodies fixing red blood cells, or maybe there will be um, petri dish grown organs like livers that will help to fix us. And um, those conversations are, are certainly exciting. Um, and my mind keeps falling back to who's going to have access to that incredible technology? Who's going to have those curative um, new ideas and uh, abilities? Uh, who will have the ability to kind of share in this incredible advancement in healthcare? And it makes me step back and think a little bit about how that's showing up for us today. This is a uh, clinic, the Odessa Brown Children's Clinic. I was clapping to myself when the name came up because I just love working there. I'm one of the few guys I know who uh, loves going to work every single day because I just have the best job in the world. I'm there in the clinic, um, and it is located right in the Central District. And these are two maps of uh, King County. The one that's on the left is the way poverty looked around the time that uh, actually I started back in the year 2000 in King County, with the darker being the more concentrated. The map on the other side is the way poverty looks in King County today. This change that you all know about is just sometimes worth seeing in its most graphic way to just understand that we are part of changing dynamic spaces around us, that the way we've defined community so easily in the past, the way we've talked about geographic barriers, naming a community is completely out the window now. And we have to think differently about how we define and how we think about community and how we respond to what a community is and needs. I think about uh, the neighborhood our clinic was started in, and when it was started back in 1970, it was 73% African American. Uh, this uh, was a prediction for what it would be in the year 2019 at the bottom. It's actually under 10% at this point. These are dynamic, big changes happening all around us all the time, and they inform this conversation about equity 
in important ways that we have to pull into context. I'm trained to be a physician. I think about health and health care, but I realized, in fact, I was taught by this amazing woman, Liz Thomas, this nurse practitioner, the first African-American nurse practitioner to graduate from the UW's uh, advanced practice school. Um, she was the one who taught me how to be a doctor. And the first days I uh, was at the clinic, she basically dragged me outside. And um, I thought we were gonna have a moment of staring at the wonderful edifice that is the clinic and talk about all the cool things we're gonna do inside there. And no, she like grabbed me and turned me around. And she said, don't look at the clinic, look away from it. Look out into the community, because there is where you're gonna do your real work and where you'll make a difference. You have to care about the kids you never see walking through your door just as much as they care about the kids you do. And that complicated things for me. It made me start to think more about like, well, how do I do that? How am I gonna be meaningful in that way? How am I gonna be part of a system that is so fragmented and pulled apart? And I thought about what it meant to promote wellness, and I just start thinking about these these mountainous areas of confusing and complicated factors all interacting to impact this idea of wellness or illness or health. It looks like, you know, a tip of the iceberg kind of picture. And as I've worked, I've started to think about this in more simplistic terms. What are the deepest, deepest roots of the things that impact the well-being of the youth that I take care of at the Odessa Brown Clinic in, here in Seattle? And I've boiled it down to three things that I wanted to talk about a little bit. Toxic capitalism, toxic oppression, and toxic stresses. So I wanted to start with toxic capitalism. And um, I will preface by saying, I used to call this toxic poverty. And I don't, I, don't, I don't wanna let us off the hook in that way anymore. Because, yeah. There's absolutely no reason why poverty should be a driver of illness except for the way that we construct our systems of capitalism in this country and the way that we treat those who are impoverished, the way we uh, assume that that denigration is gonna lead to poor health. We have to think about capitalism, not poverty in these conversations. Capitalism looks like this. If you looked at uh, the country based on dollars and dollars were equal to acres, this is the way this country would be divided where 1% would own that big, big swath uh, up in the corner there, the last 40% would own that little red dot that might be Waco or something down in Texas. This is the way wealth is distributed in this country. This has important impacts on us as a country and us as individuals. The way we distribute wealth and its inequities drives persisting, persisting unjust um, access to resources and goods in this country. You look at what happens to a woman uh, relative to a man we're doing the same hours of work and the same job and where their salaries fall based on their race. And it's disgusting. It's a crime. It's a crime against humanity. You think about the issues of, black we of wealth, not just income, but wealth, how you can continue to support your family moving forward, how you carry through in generations. It's a tragedy. It's a crime. It's a crime against our societal values. The way we distribute wealth is so unequal, the gap between the rich and poor is so unequal that it is measurable and it is relatable to every issue of health. There are a couple of folks who did, epidemiologists in England who did some studies of wealth gap and how it impacted health. You wouldn't be surprised to see for every study they did that compared countries that the USA was always the furthest to the right with the greatest wealth gap. And for every measurement of illness or wellness or well-being, they showed that the greater the wealth gap, the poorer the health, regardless of who you are in that country. This wealth gap matters, it especially matters across this country today, where we no longer actually employ people in a way that allows them to have a living wage. Creating jobs, that simple trope that you hear on the news that is the solution to economic problems in this country is such a lie now, because people don't have living wages because we've allowed productivity in our, in our industries to increase, but has not kept uh, track comparatively with the salaries that we pay people for that productivity. It is unjust, it is a crime against humanity and society. And Seattle is no different. We see Seattle sometimes as a place of opportunity and a great, place of great, great philanthropy and contribution. But I think about that sometimes and I see Seattle can be characterized in so many other ways, too. It's the fifth whitest city in the country, right? Fifth whitest city in the country still is. It also has 
several of the most diverse zip codes in the country. We are uh, an area of paradox here that is not unique to us. We're part of this country in this many different ways, but we have this paradoxical existence that we can either choose to see or choose not to see, and it shows itself especially brightly, I think, in this region. The issue of capitalism is really at the heart of how we're thinking about this issue of wealth and the wealth gap. And I can say that for sure because I work in this health field, and I can tell you, and you know, that if we had a healthcare field that cared about health, we would not have this current type of healthcare system, would we? We would not, it's just honest. We would have a single payer universal healthcare system that actually looked towards good health outcomes like every other sane country in this, in this world. We have a capitalistic healthcare system, so we actually have some of the worst health outcomes in the world and some of the greatest profits from a capitalistic perspective for a few people within it. Co toxic capitalism and its effect on well-being is at the root, the root, the root of the experiences that I see in, in my community. Toxic capitalism. And then there's toxic stress, and you, in this group especially, have become really well steeped in these ideas of ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, these list of things that the more you have, the worse chances you are to be well, and how as they increase, every measurable part of health is affected by them. It's an important set of important events in a child's life that can impact their health forever. There's other kinds of stresses also, though. There's this trickle of stress that happens every single day. It's not a big event. It's the constant little trickle of stress that creates constant trickles of stress hormones that slowly erodes every functional part of your body, every organ system um, across, across your lifespan. This constant trickle, which is different than ACEs, but has a very measurable and understandable impact on your health, is something you have to think about when we talk about this issue of well-being. We can't uniformly just talk about ACEs in individuals. And I've also come to think more about this other thing, which is just my own um, construct, so you can't look this up anywhere. Um, but <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> I was down in Canacon. I was just thinking about it. And <laughs> I think there's this other piece, um, which I think of event stress and uncertainty stress. Key moments in your life when something happens, and it could be the mildest thing in the world, and yet it leaves you with this idea that something is wrong and it's eventually going to show itself up something eroding at your sense of your own well-being. I think pregnancy and birth is one of the key moments when that can happen. And I see so many times in our clinic this these experiences where a very little thing that a doctor might completely ignore, a little bit of breathing trouble, an unplanned C-section, and boy, do we have a lot of C-sections in this country, um, a little bit of a stress about a child's well-being from birth that lends itself to thinking this child is sick and something bad is going to happen sooner or later. That kind of stress is a stress that we also need to talk about in the construct of families and family experiences when we're talking about issues of health and equity. And we have to talk about the organisms that are communities, that are groups of people working together. What is the community stress and experience? This is just, sorry for this, this is uh, one of the set of public health maps for King County showing different areas of health outcomes. And my stupid joke is, that it's the easiest job in the world to be a cartographer in King County about health because all you have to do is use the same picture and change the label and you're pretty much accurate about everything from diabetes to tobacco use to life expectancy. It's an easy job because the community well-being, the community stress, the community trauma, the community strengths, those experiences are so universally shared, almost irrespective of a person's individual set of attributes, assets, or traumas. These are the kinds of stresses that impact the community that I serve. These are at the root of toxic stresses. Toxic oppression, the way in which groups of people have been treated, denigrated, dishonored across this country. We sit here today on the stolen land of the Duwamish. We must honor that and recognize that, but we also should be ashamed. <laughs> ashamed for that experience because it's a co-opting just as much as it is a co-opting of putting a an image on a football helmet for our entertainment, or for treating uh, people as if they have no language, no names, no identities, separating them from their families and putting them into, into huge re-education schools like this, or maybe today separating mothers from their children at borders and putting them into spaces as if they're prisoners. 
These are, clap louder, because that's a really important. <laughs> That was pandering, straight up, I'm sorry. Um, but it's for this point. We have to be thinking about these issues in their full context and the full experience of them, not just today, but the generational effects and the impacts we've seen. We have to think about how we've chosen to isolate ourselves or chosen to think about ourselves in groups and how in some ways that has furthered the idea that we are not like each other that we're not on the same journey together and that we aren't having shared experiences, that somehow my issues are at the expense of your issues, your gains mean I have uh, deficits. There's a, a oneness that we have to consider even as we champion our, our identity, our pride, our sense of who we are, our cultural heritage, and the way that we celebrate that. These are the things that we need to think about because they have such tangible impacts on health. Every 10 years ago or so, there's a study of pain medication in ERs for kids where they look at a million kids and they see if you have uh, appendicitis, what's the chance that you're gonna get adequate pain medication? A million kids across this country in ERs everywhere, including ours, including the one that I work for. Um, and the chance of getting pain medication is 80% less if your skin is black. Same pain, same illnesses, different treatment. These are the things that we need to understand and study because these are not issues that are just theoretical or in the air or in the past or in some other place that's not ours. This is us. This is us. We have to think about these issues because they are so important, especially at those key moments in life. Um, this is maybe one of the best articles describing both the data and the stories and experiences uh, of what it means to be an American black woman having a child today. So if you have a chance to look back to April of last year and look at that article, I would, I would, I would throw this into recommended reading for any class that was covering this topic. And these are important issues and they touch our lives, not just the African-American lives, but across our country. We're the only developed country that is having an increase in maternal, maternal mortality, an increase that's pretty dramatically different from everyone else across this world. These are the issues that we talk about and we think about. These are the things that have been historically part of our world. And it makes me think also about how I participate in these thoughts and conversations. I think about um, these amazing women that uh, made up the history of the Odessa Brown Clinic. And the lower left over there is Odessa Brown herself, a single mom, a community activist, a strong, oh, my mom would have loved Odessa Brown. <laughs> Spoke her mind, she knew what, she, what was right, and she raised her kids to think about something different. The middle one is uh, Blanche Levizo, the first African-American pediatrician in the Northwest area who started our clinic with this idea that you deserve quality care and dignity. You can't just think about the technical parts of care, you have to think about the components of dignity that make up what it means to be a human in this society. Liz Thomas is that upper one, the one that taught me uh, how to be a doctor. I speak of them all the time in these very glowing terms and I realize something maybe six months ago, that I felt like I was doing them a disservice. I spoke of their, their, their leadership, their strength. I, I talked a lot about their resilience and how they did this hard work and somehow managed to be these incredible leaders at the same time and how much work that they put into that. And then I started to think about it and I had to come to a really important realization. Odessa Brown, she died too young of cervical cancer, advanced cancer that was Untreated, untreatable. Dr. Blanche Levizo, she died too young of breast cancer. Liz Thomas died too young of kidney cancer. Our clinic is right next to another clinic called Carolyn Downs Family Medicine Clinic. It's the, actually the last um, Black Panther clinic in the nation. Really important point of pride for this area. Carolyn Downs herself died too young of cancer. We talk about resilience, we talk about sort of iconography when we think about uh, great people like this. Sometimes you think about that in the way you think about the communities of color even, oh, the resilience within that, wow, an amazing sense of the ability to transcend hardship. I think that sells a story short. I want you to think about that word resilience. You may come to the same conclusion you've had before, that it's a wonderful word and it means a lot to you. I want you to consider that it might be a microaggression. I want you to consider that it might reflect um, how someone is in a state of great adversity, and in a way might almost say that adversity doesn't matter, it's the resilience that does matter in that. 
I want you to think about words like resilience and other concepts in our lives that sometimes with our own best intentions, my own best intentions, actually bring our conversation backwards rather than forwards. I did the same thing with um, racism. I used to talk so much about differences in health based on race or different healthcare outcomes that are based on race. And then I realized, okay, Sheila taught me this, but I realized partly also on my own but, <laughs> that these are differences based on racism, not race, right? This is racism acting, not race. They're not the biologic differences in race that should have those health outcomes. We should change our language to really talk about differences in health and well-being based on racism and not be afraid to use that word because that's the word that matters in that conversation. Does that make sense? <laughs> Resilience is this, a beautiful flower in some abjectly deprived environment. That's not the strength that Odessa Brown or Liz Thomas had. They had strengths that were well beyond that, strengths that were abject positive, strengths that could teach everyone in this room something that would make their lives better, not just the ability to bloom in adversity. I think about these things that make you have to rethink what you're doing and what you're talking about. I think about this issue that comes up so much in public health, right? And in medicine and in, and in anybody who's ever written a grant, this idea of moving a needle, this ask for you to move the needle within some short time, I want you to think about that concept. I want someone to be brave enough to say, I am sorry, oh, who should I offend? <laughs> Casey Foundation, I don't know, uh, I am sorry. I am not going to write for a grant that tells me to move the needle within a short time. You know what I think moving the needle does? I think moving the needle makes the, those who are the least disenfranchised, the most able to take advantage of an inter, of a intervention and move themselves up very quickly into a place where they are, have more agency. I think it actually leaves the bulk of the people that you care the most about further behind. It widens the gap. We see this in the data all the time. Improvements that widen gaps. I think this is the evil specter that is actually at the root of that. I want you to rethink the way we talk about improvement and moving the needle on what we count as tangible. I am looking forward to the day, I'm gonna be really proud when I can stand here in front of you and say, I have this new measure, and it's called potential energy. It's not the measured thing that you wanted to see happen within six months of receiving your money, it's, it's a potential energy. It's the strength that happened within a community. It was the ability of that community to, to name their own future, their own path, because we invested in them. That's different than moving the needle. I want us to think about things that make us passive about the future. There's this whole thing about by some year, we are going to not be any majority culture. We're going to hit this 50% line, and suddenly, magically, the rainbow will just continue to shine, and everything is going to be even and equal and equitable and wonderful after that. That is a full-on lie. You know that, right? <laughs> I'm sure somebody smarter than me could name 10 or 20 countries where a tiny minority has a horrible uh, hold on power and harms a huge majority of people. There's nothing numerically fancy or special, so don't let someone like me stand in front of you and say, not too long from now, you just wait. You don't have to do anything today. Just hang out for a while, because pretty soon, there's gonna be a different numerical thing, and then it's, everybody's gonna treat everybody different. That's not the way the world has worked. I wouldn't expect that to work here. We have to fight this sense of apathy this desire to sort of sit in this space and hope with our kindness and our passivity that something good is gonna happen and then we can wake up and enter a world that's better. We have to challenge ourselves to push harder, to do something that makes us uncomfortable in order to change, because change really feeds on comfort. Uh, sorry, stability feeds on comfort. Change feeds on discomfort. I think about how to push a bar, how to take a term that might feel comfortable before, like equity. Let's just say equity is treating everybody fair or giving people what they need. Let's change that definition on its head and think about it in a more uncomfortable way. Equity is something that is named by those who are most affected, by the communities themselves, not by you. Equity demands sacrifice and sharing, redistributing power. Northwest Children's Fund, by fundraising, is trying to do that directly, but we have to be more aggressive about changing power structures. 
need to break systems of racism. We need to focus on healing, something you'll hear Dr. Jin Wright talk a lot about, what it means to actually heal, because I fervently believe we could do all the good work from here moving forward in the present and in the future, and if we have not promoted healing, we will not make a difference. Let's think more challengingly, in a way that scares us a little bit, about the concepts that we've become comfortable with, like equity. Equity is disruptive. It's supposed to be uncomfortable. And it's the only way you're going to get to a better future. I think about these things and how you can actually state what you mean when you mean it, how you can create a space. A year or so ago in our clinic, we decided we had to say very clearly what we mean when we say our families that come here are safe here. Not, not legal language, not fancy doctor talk, but that this place is a sanctuary and you are safe here. If you're a space, has a statement about sanctuary, but it is so clouded in legalese that you know the people who you're actually speaking to will not understand what you're saying. You have not done them anything, none, no justice. You've helped yourself feel a little bit better. You've not helped them. Think about the words that we use and how we use them today and how we can change their meaning into something that is actually actionable. I think about these things and the ways in which we have to reframe what it means to be an American, what it means to be part of this country and this culture, and what it means to be beside people who don't look like us or think like us or act like us and are so much, we are so much the better because of it. We the people. We the people, not some accumulation of labels and titles and things that we want to categorize ourselves by, but we the people. We the people is this beautiful tapestry. This is my shameful sharing of my mom's quilt work with you. <laughs> but that's a huge, King size, like that size quilt. And <laughs> awesome. I'm going to tell my mom she got a really big clap from, and it wasn't Canacon, although she'd probably be downstairs. Um, think about <laughs> what it really means to be a tapestry that makes up a person, that makes up a community, makes up a society in this world. My work, I am sometimes too close, too close to that quilt. All I see is one of those squares, which is pretty enough, and I don't step back enough. So back enough and see what I'm saying, see what I'm doing, question how I'm looking at things. I don't step back enough and get a perspective on this work. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Think about how we talk about experiences and service and the communities that we work with. Think about whose story you are telling and who gets to tell that story. Not just because it's respectful for a child to be able to tell their own story or respectful for a parent to be able to name their own story. Not even just because it is a, a fundamental to that statement of equity that the post person most affected gets to name what happens and what happened. Not even just because I think it is one of the greatest tools towards healing. It's also because there's something very pragmatic about it that Plato said, and I think that that is absolutely true. Stories are power. We have to think about whose power we are co-opting and whose power we are sharing. Think about these cycles that make up not individuals and not even just communities, but generations and how people are connected. Um, I also, I will spare you my goofy joke about this and I will just say that what I understand now as a pediatrician is that that child is such a product of not just a mother, but generations of people. That in fact, half of the DNA that went into making that child that I get to see in the clinic was actually not made by mom, but was made by grandma. Remember that grandma when she made the body and the eggs that existed in mom? Mom was born with all the eggs that she'll ever have. She didn't make them new. And those eggs, be those eggs became half of the DNA for this child. Think about the generational, blow your mind with a simple truth, understand generations beyond you, do a little time traveling. Think about how those impact the way we talk about equity and investment. If that baby gets to grow up and have wonderful experiences while she's making the eggs that might make her grandchild, what would that do for the generations of impact based on the work that you do today? I think about those things because I see this every day. So whenever I get like kind of, I don't know, I think I was a little grumpy this morning when I was talking to the other panelists and I was kind of like, ah oh, man, this works hard and I get tired so I don't want to have to be like broad minded. And then <laughs> I think about 
where I get to work every day and the faces I see, and all I see in that is promise and potential and strength, and anything that encourages that is the right thing to do, and anything that gets in the way of that is the wrong thing to do. I feel like that baby's kind of challenging us a little bit too, right? You better think about that. Think about how that encourages you to unlearn and change the things that frame the way you thought the world was structured and what it meant. Encourage yourself to unlearn. Unlearning is as important, maybe more important than learning because it creates the capacity for you to be open to new ideas and new things. Think about how you could actively unlearn. We the people. This is goofy to show this, and it probably bends towards my patriotic side a bit, but I do notice that We the People was written in ginormous font compared to every other word in that important document. And I think it meant something. It meant that this is about us, we the people. That we the people name what should and could and would be done to make this a better country. We the people are the most important, the most prominent, the most, the most visible part of this whole contract. We the people. I hope we think about what that means. And what incredible onus, responsibility that puts on us to be the agents of change, the supporters of change, or the get out of the wayers, I think is a word, of change that we need to be in order to help this be a better society. Because this society is not monolithic and monocultural. It is one that is beautiful. It is beautiful like the waiting room in the clinic that I get to work in every day. It's, it's beautiful like this room is beautiful. It is multi-layered and multi-complexed. There's no easy answers, no straight up one directional way to think about this, and that's what makes it powerful. Think about doing the work because it should be the work, not because you're gonna get some fancy award or some high recognition for change or something. Think about these things as we talk today. Make it part of your mind and your contemplation and build that into the way you structure your questions, your conversations, how you ask yourself important questions. Because <laughs> It's important, <laughs> it's important. These small people are so counting on you and are hoping for you to be part of the change that they need to see. And because what I see every day in the community I serve are these amazing little geniuses. And I hope that will carry something in your heart and in your heads as you hear the rest of this conversation today because that's what it's all about if you're a pediatrician at least. Thank you very much for listening to me. Now I have the incredible honor of introducing and welcoming our main guest speaker today. This is a, an incredible treat. I'm a great, big fan of his and I've only become more an admirer as we've talked a little bit this morning. Dr. Sean Ginwright hails from the Bay Area and is an associate professor of education in the African Studies Department at San Francisco State. He's the leading expert on Amer African American youth and youth activism. He authored a book titled, Hope and Healing in Urban Education, How Activists and Teachers Are Reclaiming Matters of the Heart. He's also the CEO of Flourish Agenda, a social, impact, um, sorry, a social impact company that supports schools and community organizations with building healthy school climates. Dr. Ginwright was awarded the prestigious Fulbright Senior Specialist Award for his research and work with urban youth, and you know none of that matters for him. He is here from a very special place. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sean Ginwright. I want to say thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Ben. You are the Steph Curry of <laughs> medicine. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, it's always, uh, it's always a, a pleasure to come to Seattle. Um, one of the first things I notice, because I live in Oakland, California, uh, my wife and I were walking downtown and the city's so clean. 
Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's just wonderful to be in this environment. And I, you know, I've had an opportunity to travel to different cities and, and share ideas about healing. And one of the things that I'm recognizing and healing is a yearning for those who work deeply with young people across our country, a yearning for another way to heal the harm that young, many young people are facing in their neighborhoods, in their communities, and schools. I'm hearing a yearning for another way to address ACEs and to support young people by saturating their lives with opportunities to heal. And so I want to be able to share with you today some of those lessons that I've learned from teachers who, are, who work in very difficult neighborhoods throughout our country, from youth workers who deal with trauma on a daily basis in New York, um, from social workers who have to deal with young people around the, uh, in their neighborhoods they are bringing to their, their centers and in their homes uh, various forms of trauma that they sometimes are not equipped to deal with. I also know that the systems that we have in our society, that we cannot think about trauma only as an individual actor, in, only impacting individuals, but sometimes the very systems that we're in are traumatized. The schools carry trauma. The social services carry trauma. And sometimes even police departments carry trauma. And if we don't have a robust and a courageous way to provide healing strategies, then we continue to reproduce the inequality that we have in our society. So I want to say thank you again, brother, for those, those, those profound words. And, and I hope that to, to build from um, some of the concepts that we just, ha that we just heard. There's two things I want to say before I sort of go into the presentation. And that is, I think sometimes in our society, we get so close to our work. We get so engaged and so passionate in our work that we, uh, we, we tend to ad adopt and um, believe that we can engage in remedial social change. That is, that we are so focused on problem solving, that we're so focused on reducing the misery, that we don't, have to, we don't develop an imagination and a dream and a hope to actually create new kinds of opportunities. And so when we focus only on the reduction of violence, we never think about how to increase peace. When we focus on the reduction of illness, we never focus on how to build hope. And so I think what I hope you leave with in some of the concepts that I'm going to share with you today is not just um, an understanding of the challenges that we face, the ways in which trauma embeds itself in individuals, the way in which it embeds itself in in, in, in our relationships and in the ways it embeds itself in institutions, but really a profound way to push us more courageously to think about healing strategies for our own lives and for the lives of the young people that we care deeply about. I um, have, a, uh, have an opportunity to, um, I was just talking to um, Dr. Ben as we're walking into the, the, the auditorium, and as a professor at San Francisco State University, um, I have an opportunity to test ideas with my graduate students like every week. And, um, you know, a few years ago, um, I began to talk about healing. And I also began to think that the ideas are bigger than academics, right? There are people that are working in the lives of, of, of uh, young people around the country that are yearning for these tools. I know that my own training as a youth development professional, um, when I worked in uh, Oakland, California, in San Diego, we used to call what we did youth development, and we used to call it uh, leadership development, and we used to call it all kinds of things, but over the past 20 years in my work with young people in communities, what I, what I, what I really realized is that development is, means nothing without healing. And that young people, sometimes, if we, if we think of our work only as um, developing young people, that we forget that it is the healing process that actually transforms their lives. And also, uh, the second point that I want to make today is that there's a way in which we're trained as professionals, as social workers and therapists and doctors and physicians, and that we believe that our engagement with young people is a one-way street. That is, 
that that young person has trauma and I can support them with their trauma. And I think that's a wrong framework because what we also have to do is think about the trauma that we have in us, right? That just because we're adults doesn't mean that we are fixed, that we are somehow immune from the systems that have been toxic in our lives. And that if we're not engaged in a pro process of healing, we give it to young people as well. So this is a bilateral process, y'all, right? That our ability to be well translates to our ability to help young people be well. But if, as soon as we think that I'm gonna save young people, that I'm gonna heal this young person without deep introspection about who we are and the ways in which trauma embeds in us, then we've also reproduced inequality. My wife always teases me. She says, all these ideas came from me. And she's right. <laughs> she's right, she's right there. One night over dinner, one night over dinner, um, we were talking about the necessity for our society and the work that we do um, in training people who work with young people as to have uh, what she called a lens and a mirror. And most of the time, we're trained as professionals to have a lens on society. That is, that we can name racism and homophobia and classism, and, which is necessary. We need a lens to understand the conditions of society, but we also need a mirror. And the mirror allows us to have deep reflection about the ways in which toxicity influences us, but also a mirror allows us to reimagine our lives and reimagine our engagement with young people. And so I hope some of these ideas that I share with you today pushes us and pushes us to reconsider and reimagine uh, the work that we do. Um, I wanna start with a story. Um, about five years ago, I um, completed a book called Black Youth Rising, which is about African-American men, uh, young men in Oakland, California. And it was about the transformation of their lives and the supports that were necessary in their community-based organizations to support those young men in their transformation. And somehow my book ended up uh, in a reading circle with a group, a group of men in prison. And so I got an email that read something like this. It said, Dr. Jenright, um, there are 10 men here in prison that have gotten, that have, you know, have read your book, Black Youth Rising, and we'd love it if you could come out and speak to them. And I had debated whether or not I would take the invitation. And so, on, it was on a Saturday morning, so I, I got an excuse for my wife to go out. I didn't have to do the honeydews that day. So I went out to the prison, and I, you know, I said I'd, I'd be happy to, to, to share the ideas, and I had prepared a you know, kind of my comments about my research and how the book came about. And at the prison, I don't know if you've ever been to a prison, but in California, there are certain ways you have to, clothes you have to wear in the prison. They said, don't wear jeans, don't wear these colors, and so on and so forth, and make sure you have your ID. So when I got to the prison, I went up to the gate and the correctional officer said, uh, Dr. Jenright, we're glad you're here. Uh, the men are in the cafeteria, they're waiting for you. Um, they're excited. Um, the cafeteria is a little tricky to get to, but just following the instructions when you pass through the gate, and the, uh, the remaining correctional officers will guide you to the cafeteria. So as I entered the gate, the first correctional officer said, there's a red line on the floor, and there's a bunch of lines with different colors. Just follow that red line all the way to the end of the corridor. So I follow that line all the way to the end of the corridor where I was met with a door. And that door buzzed open. Bzzz and I walked through it, and the door shut behind me. Boom. There was another correctional officer at the other side of that door, and she said, Dr. Jenright, um, I know you're going to the cafeteria. Just find the green line on the floor and follow this green line to the end of the corridor. So I looked on the floor, and I followed the, looked at the green line, and I followed that green line all the way to the end of that long corridor where I was met with a door, and that door buzzed open. Bzzz and I walked through it, and it shut behind me. Boom. As you, as you know, there was another correctional officer. You're almost to the cafeteria, Dr. Jenright. Just find a, there's a blue line on the floor. Just follow this one all the way to the end of that corridor, and you'll be near the cafeteria. So I found the blue line, and I followed it all the way to the end of the corridor. That door buzzed open, Bzzz, and I walked through it, and it shut behind me. Boom. 
But by the time that third door shut, something shifted inside of me. I began to feel the sense of incarceration. I began to feel captured and enclosed. And I began to imagine what these men who I was about to talk to feel every day. And I became deeply insecure. I didn't know what to say to them. I knew that I began to imagine that they couldn't feel the sun on their faces, they couldn't embrace their children. And so what I, the, the comments that I had prepared, I immediately threw them away because I began to feel insecure and vulnerable, like what can I say to these men that could actually make a difference? And so whatever comments I had, I decided that I wasn't going to talk about that. And so as I entered or got close to the cafeteria, they opened the door to the cafeteria, and I had anticipated the 10 men waiting for me. But when they opened the double doors, I was shocked at what I saw. Rather than 10 men waiting for me, there were 200 men in their orange jumpsuits, all excited to see me. I was like, wow, I wish I would have told me there's 200 <laughs> people here. And they were excited to see me. They, one of them walked up to me. His name was Greg. He said, Dr. G, man, I'm, uh, I'm glad you're here, man. We, I'm one of the brothers that read your book. And man, I'm just glad you're here. I'm, I've been here since 1987. And my heart sank. And then Chris walked up to me. Hey, Dr. Jen Wright, I didn't actually read your book, but <laughs> I'm glad you're here. I've been in here since 1989. And one by one, they came up to me and told me their name and the year they had entered that prison. And I began to be more and more and more insecure about what I was going to tell these men, because certainly I wasn't going to talk to them about my research. And so they ushered me up onto the stage. And rather than me referring to my research and the, how I wrote the book, I just spoke from my heart, y'all. And I just told them about my concerns and challenges that I was experiencing raising a 15-year-old son in Oakland, California, because he's six foot three, and I'm afraid of his safety. I just talked about the challenges and the concerns I have because my parents are aging. And I just talked to them for 45 minutes from my heart. And I told them at the end of my comments that no matter what you did that brought you here, there's always a possibility of healing and that you are not what brought you here. You're more than that. And I said a few more things and a few more comments, and by the time I was done, the, uh, the correctional officer said, okay, it's time for them to go back to their cells. And so they were ushering the men back to their cells, and they were ushering me out, out, of, the, out of the cafeteria when I heard this loud, booming voice behind me. Hey, Dr. G. And it's a true story. Uh, There's a tall brother, man. He must have been seven feet tall, 300 pounds. And I was like, what's up, bruh? <laughs> and he said, hey, man, I just want to let you know, Dr. G, that those words you shared with, with us, they really touched me, man. They, you spoke from your heart, and they, you talked about healing, and it, it just really helped me. And I said, that's good, man. I'm glad whatever I said was useful for you. He said, no, I really want you to hear me. You see, because I'm so tall, right, people think I'm a threat in here. They always pushed me to fight, and a few years ago, I got in a fight in here, and they cut me in the face. He had leaned down, and he had a scar across his face, and I said, man, I'm so sorry, to, so sorry to hear that. And he said, but you know, there's, there's something that you said that there's always a possibility of healing, even in, in places like this, that resonated with me, because there's something that I do every single day that allows me to heal. And I'm like, what is it that you do? And he, he reached into his pocket, and I was like, oh. What are you doing? <laughs> the correctional officer said, hey, man, it's cool. And he reached into his pocket, and he pulled out a little bottle. And he opened the bottle, and he blew bubbles. And the bubbles floated over my head. And my first thought was, did this big brother just blow bubbles in my face <laughs> in prison? And he said, I blow bubbles, man, because it reminds me when I was a child. It reminds me, it heals me, because my father used to bring me to the park. And so when I blow these bubbles, it helps me heal in a difficult place like this. There's something that I need to do every day 
to endure, to hope, to dream, and to heal. And so thank you. And so as I drove home that night, that afternoon, I, I heard his voice echoing in my head that these bubbles heal me. And I began to be really curious about what are our bubble stories? How do, what do we do every day to promote healing for ourselves and for the young people that we care about? How do people who love children and young people, how do they create healing in really difficult situations and contexts? And so I became deeply curious about healing stories about the context of racism and poverty, but also the courageous acts it takes to actually saturate young people's lives with healing opportunities. And so as I began to do research, um, the first thing I recognized is that there are challenges to healing, that healing is not always easy. And in the book that I wrote on this topic called Hope and Healing in Urban Education, the first thing I do is begin to document well, what are some of the challenges to healing? And we've already heard some of those challenges of racism and poverty, that these things are not just structural, but they have an impact on our well-being. And one of the concepts that you've already heard um, today about toxicity, this work, this research comes from James Gabarino in a book called Raising Children in a Socially Toxic Environment. And similar to what you heard about capitalist toxicity, right, and the other forms of toxicity, what James Gabarino says is that, you know, there are two kinds of toxicities that we have in our society. There are physical toxins, and those are things that are like asbestos and lead paint. And if you are exposed, if you think about asbestos and lead paint in your home, your apartment, or even in your work, if you're exposed to that physical toxin, that over time, that physical toxin will make you ill. And if you're not healed from that exposure to that physical toxins, like asbestos and lead paint, if you're not healed from it, it could become lethal. Well, James Gabarino says that there are social equivalents to physical toxins. And social toxins are just as deadly or lethal. And social toxins are things like fear, anxiety, stress, insecurity, shame. And those things are just as present in our environment as physical toxins. But oftentimes, we are only able to, to focus on and understand we misdiagnose the root of the problem. And so he, he offers a way for us to then frame the kind of challenges or the, and some of the causes that actually make healing more difficult. Here's an example of social toxins. You probably remember the summer of 2015 and 2016, and, and it still continues with Freddie Gray and, all, and Oscar Grant. And I remember that, I remember the, that summer of 15 and 16 when, Af when uh, African-American young men were being hunted by police, and police officers will, be sh will shoot young men. I remember my son leaving the house at 15 with his hoodie on, with his friends in Oakland, California at 8 o'clock at night, being concerned over his safety social toxicity. Here's another form of social toxins, that we have uh, uh, um, policies, what's happening with children being separated from their families, right? Uh, immigrant families who are being uh, characterized as criminals is a form of social toxins that this characterization is, re is uh, encouraging families not to take their children to the doctor, not to to take them to get a dental appointment, and sometimes removing them from school for fear of deportation. So all of these are forms of, of social toxins that are just as present in our environment that we have to name and identify. And our naming and identify allows us forced to then understand some of the challenges to healing. So how does this work, and how does the social conditions and social toxins in our systems have an influence on our lives and our bodies? This is an illustration that I think is a, is, a, is a way to sort of think about social toxins and the way that they actually shape our lives. This is a picture of, let's call her Mia. And Mia is a social worker who deeply cares about children and is working in communities and working to support the transformation of young people's lives. But what Mia doesn't understand is that the neighborhood and the school she works in also is saturated 
with social toxicity. And social toxins are like rain clouds. And unlike regular rain that sort of wets us up, social toxins get inside of us. Racism, homophobia, classism, poverty have a toxic impact on our inside well-being, and sometimes we're unaware that they're located in our psychology. They're located in our bodies. Now, Mia doesn't know this, and so what happens is Mia becomes frustrated from her exposure to social toxins. It has an impact at, her, at the individual level. Social toxins also have an impact at the interpersonal level, the relationships that she has with her coworkers, the relationships we have with other young people, the relationships we have with parents. But also at social toxins have an impact at the institutional level. And those social toxins influence the values, the practices, and the policies of that institution. And the institution itself then, because of its exposure, then produces more social toxins that go back out into society, and it reproduces itself. So our job as social workers and therapists and teachers and educators is to disrupt this process, that we understand the ways in which inequality gets reproduced, but our job is to understand the ways in which it situates itself at the individual level, the interpersonal level, and at the institutional level. And when we do that, we begin to then, um, we begin to shift our diagnosis from what are symptomatic behaviors, violent behavior, fatalism, depression and anxiety are all symptoms of, much, of something that's much more fundamental. And so as a, as a matter of fact, in schools, for example, most teachers are trained to deal with exposure to social toxins with one tool, discipline, right? So if there's violent behavior or fatalism or anxiety or something that shows up in a classroom that looks like non-compliant non behavior, what we're trained in education is to say, let's treat that with discipline. Because discipline is the cure-all for something that's not right in my classroom, right? And we know that that is actually harmful to young people, and it reproduces harm for young people. And so teachers, I think, like physicians, need to get more curious about what's happening in young people's lives to have a more accurate diagnosis about what's going on. And we need to train teachers to have an ability to understand the exposure to inequality, suffering, and structural racism, right? To deal with that is not just to provide an awareness that it happens, but to provide pathways for young people to heal from it. We have to begin to retrain our workforce, our workforce in a way that doesn't see a myopic understanding of young people's behavior, but has a broader view of the structural realities that create suffering in young people's lives. I was, had the opportunity about three years ago uh, to work with a group of uh, 15 African-American boys in Oakland. And I was trained myself in trauma-informed care and had worked with young people for a, a long time. And during one night, on a Wednesday night, we would meet at a community college. We were sitting in our blue chairs, eating pizza. And I was having, talking about the impact of trauma and toxic stress on their decision making. And so I was asking them to retell and revisit and be, and, and be open and honest about the thing that happened to them. And they had an enormous stories of trauma from homelessness to sexual abuse to violence, all the kinds of trauma that you could imagine showed up in these young people. And I'm gonna go off script for just a moment because I feel like I'm at home, <laughs> y'all family. Um, we need to, sh um, in, in terms of language, we use this term post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a misdiagnosis because there's nothing post about the trauma that young people experience. We, we also call it a disorder which locates trauma in the individual, and we know that trauma doesn't exist just in the individual. And I prefer the term persistent traumatic stress environment, PTSE, because it allows us to take a, great, uh, a more holistic lens about the issues and the challenges that create trauma in the first place. Now, that was off script. I wasn't, that's not part of my slide. So 
with that said, we were talking, having this healing conversation, and one of the young men said in the group, man, I'm tired of talking about this. Dr. G, he said, I'm more than what happened to me. I'm not just my trauma. And I thought he was just being a jokester. I'm like, man, you're always throwing, uh, 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 you're always throwing a curveball in my healing circles. <laughs> and he said it again, and one of the other young men said, yeah, man, I want to talk about how I want to open up, um, I want to open up a, um, a, 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 a auto repair shop. He loved working on cars. And another young man said, yeah, man, you know, I want to talk about uh, me becoming a technician to, to network computers. They began to talk about their dreams, not their trauma. And so I began to really think about my own understanding of trauma-informed care, right? And as I reread the literature and the research, I began to come up with their questions, not mine, about some of the shortcomings and limitations about the ways in which we think about trauma and the, and the ways in which it actually situates in the, young, in the lives of young people. And so in the article that you may have read called uh, Shifting from Trauma-Informed Care to Healing-Centered Engagement, some people misread that article to say we need to abandon trauma-informed care, and I'm not suggesting that. What I'm suggesting is that trauma-informed care is, is important, but it's incomplete. And it's incomplete because, one, there's a way in which we think about trauma as an individual experience versus a collective experience. I could talk to African-American, Latino young boys who are 16 years old in Seattle, and they'll have the same story about the police that the young men will have in Chicago. This is a collective experience, and so when we think about trauma, we can't think of it as only an individual act. Second, that our, our, a way in which we think about trauma-informed care fails to address the root causes of trauma in the first place. That trauma is systemic. That trauma is not something that accidentally happens to you, but trauma is a result of, of, uh, it's a result of political decisions, about lack of investments, about structural inequality. Third, that trauma tends to focus on coping rather than healing. Let me allow you to think about ways to decompensate, ways to navigate your stress, right? It, talks, it doesn't get at the root cause, which is healing from our exposure to these forms of inequality. So when we talk about trauma-informed care, I argue that we need to shift to a framework that gives it a much more holistic understanding, which we call healing-centered engagement. And healing-centered engagement allows us to have a greater view, a greater gaze at the structural inequality that situates itself for young people, but also for ourselves. And so when we talk about shifting to a healing-centered engagement, there are a few principles. The first is that healing-centered engagement is explicitly political rather than clinical. Right? Explicitly political rather than clinical. And this basically means that we have to have a political understanding of inequality and well-being. That young people's trauma is not just a focus of an accident. Political, uh, explicitly political means that when we engage and have an understanding of the things that harm us, right, that our well-being is connected to much more than, our, than just genetics or decisions, right? Second, healing-centered engagement is culturally grounded and views healing as the restoration of our identity. A friend of mine in California, his name is Jerry Teo, he says, la cultura cura. The culture cures, right? And so this means that we have two things to, to ponder. One, that many ways, that in many ways, where our identities our identities are the re reasons why we're harmed in our society. If your race, your gendered identity, GLBT communities, their identities are those that are under, are, are the ones that are under attack. And culture means that sometimes a cure is in the culture. My mama used to say, the blacker the berry, the sweeter the juice. Now, that was a term that she would use over and over again, and I didn't know at the time, and not until I got to college, right, what she meant by that. She was providing me an antidote for internalized racism, right? So that when we, 
where we embrace ourselves and situate ourselves in our culture, what we discover is that there's cures there and that our cures need to be much more explicit in our treatments, our cures need to be much more explicit in our strategies, and our cures need to be much more explicit in our understanding of what's possible. Third, healing-centered engagement is asset-driven and focuses on the well-being we want rather than symptoms we want to suppress. And so this suggests that we have to look at communities who've been exposed to trauma, not as some kind of broken condition, right? Not some kind of deficit condition, but communities, right, as Sheila talked about earlier today in our conversation before, that our communities have strengths for centuries and years, and that if we only think about the brokenness of our communities, that we don't actually get at the assets. And so we have to view the assets of our communities as a part of the strategy. I was having this conversation um, um, uh, 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 last month with public health officials, and I, and I was talking about the example in the black community. Every brother usually knows where the black barbershops are. Well, that's where we go get our hair cut, right? And I was explaining that there was this process where they, that's an asset in our community. And what would it look like, right, if we use barbershops as a way to saturate black men's lives with well-being? You have com conversations with your barber. That's an asset in the community that sometimes we can, we can use as a process to, to um, saturate young men with uh, opportunities for well-being and healing. So our shift to healing-centered engagement doesn't mean that we abandon trauma-informed care. It means we add to it. And lastly, that we have to take seriously the ways in which trauma and toxicity has an, an influence on the adult providers. This is a huge missing element in our work. We assume and presume that because we're professionally trained that somehow the toxicity doesn't impact us. That somehow we are immune from racism or somehow we're immune from the trauma that we've experienced. Or somehow that because I'm an adult, that thing that happened to me when I was 15 years old doesn't matter in my work with this other 15-year-old. Y'all hear me? So we have to take seriously our own well-being. We have to embrace our own strategies to be well. And I always say that our ability to be well is not some individual act. Our, our ability to be well is a right. We have the ability to be well even in the context of social inequality. How do we create, then, these systems that heal rather than harm? What is, what is it that we do? I have a friend that works at, at UC Berkeley, and I was explaining to her that this notion of toxicity and, and the ways in which toxicity has an influence on us. And she said that she said um, she was a botanist at UC Berkeley. She worked in a botany, uh, a lab that did all kind of things with plants. And she said that, you know what, you're talking about toxicity. You know, we do these experiments in my lab that try to understand how plants respond to different forms of toxic gas. And she said, one time we took, this, we took these plants, and what we would do is we would pump gas, different kinds of toxic gas, into the chamber. And then what we would do is try to understand how those gases influence the plant. And most of the time, the plants would die. And I'd be like, I'm not talking about death. I'm talking about resiliency. And she said, no, listen, listen, what I'm, what I'm trying to get you to understand, Sean. And she said, one time we took those same plants and we put them in the same chamber. And we put, and we, instead of putting one plant, we put multiple plants in that chamber. And we pumped the same gas into that chamber. But when we pumped that gas into the chamber, the plants together reacted miraculously different, something really we hadn't seen before happen. She said when we pumped the gas in there, the plants actually began to take different nutrients out of the soil. And they began to like process those nutrients in the soil differently. And the plants actually began to produce a gas in the chamber that cleaned up the gas we were pumping into it. They detoxified their environment. They cleaned up the toxicity in their own environment by working together. And I thought that that was a wonderful metaphor for our work. 
How do we begin to detoxify our environment with racism and homophobia and sexism and classism, all of the things that make it difficult for healing? And so as I was talking to this notion about how do we create environments that heal in really difficult situations, I was in Stockton, California last month, and a teacher, after she heard my talk, she ran up to me and she was so excited. She said, Dr. Jenright, Dr. Jenright, I'm so glad you're here. We read your book. And look what we, she was the principal, not a teacher. She was the principal of a school. And she said three things. She said, 60% of the, the young people that come to my school have some form of trauma. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. Two, we have one therapist that comes in every two weeks. Right? Three, the district nor the city will provide any funding to address this issue. And she said, we needed to address this in our own way. And she said that we took a classroom, a classroom where we normally have students reading or something, and we decided to make it into a healing spa. And she said, we, you could see that they covered the, the, uh, the lights, their blue paper over the lights to make it calm, and they put bean bags in there, and they had incense or, or um, diffusers so that it smells uh, nice in there, and there's soft music. And she said that by placing this classroom, this place, this healing center in our school, it centered everyone so that anyone can use this place at any time. The students can come in, the teachers could come in, the custodial staff could come in, anybody could use it. There's only one requirement, is that you use it in silence. The reason I think this is an example is that it doesn't, it doesn't require, healing doesn't require a $2 million budget. <laughs> and while it may be good <laughs> to have a $2 million budget, but the urgency for our ability to create healing is now we have to act immediately. And her example provides us with ways and insights that we can begin to think about healing in our own context. So when we talk about healing-centered approach, there are three things. Healing-centered approach involves first healing and engaging in well-being at the individual level, what are the things that actually I need to heal from? What are the things that my exposure to toxicity is shaped by? The second is healing our relationships and our interpersonal relationships and in our communities. Communities are traumatized and institutions experience trauma. So how do we think about strategies to heal both the relationships and our collective communities so that we don't think about healing as only um, individual acts? We also have to heal our relationships, y'all. I was uh, working with a group of activists. And the second point resonated with these activists because they said that even though we fight for justice, sometimes we do it in toxic ways. And that if we're not, if we're not careful about, un, uh, about healing our relationships, and if you think about your own relationships even right now, take an inventory of your relationships, your professional relationships and your personal relationships. There's probably relationships that you can actually identify as feeding you, and there was those relationships that drain you, <laughs> right? So our relationships and healing those relationships become a significant and important part of our, the ecosystem of healing. And then thirdly, we have to transform the institutions, the policies, and the systems that are causing the harm in the first place. We can't look at healing as just some isolated individual act or healing our relationships, but we also have to look at the ways in which the policies actually shape and cause harm in the first place. We use five principles at Flourish Agenda to really think about this notion of healing. We call it karma, culture, agency, relationships, meaning, and aspirations. And I want to quickly sort of talk about each of those because I think they have currency for our own individual process of healing, but also the ways in which we can think about healing strategies for the young people that we work with at our workplace. The first is culture, an awareness of one's own and others' humanity, ethnic history, racial, and other social identities. This means, that, this means that we have to ask questions about who we are in the work that we do. What does it mean to be white working in a community of color? What does it, what does it mean to be African-American working in a white community? What does it mean 
How do we interrogate these questions about identity in ways that are actually meaningful? Culture means that we lift up who we are in this work. It means that we actually identify aspects of ourselves that have currency in the, in the ability to transform our lives and have an impact on young people. The second is agency, right, right, which is the individual and the collective ability to create the change and the root causes of personal and social uh, challenges. How do we act? It's not this, it's how do we act to actually change these systems? And I always like to say that we can engage in both micro and macro acts of change, of agency. If you think about the environmentalist movement, we all recycle, right? The bottle, water bottles on our table will not end up in, um, will not end up in, uh, they will end up in a recycle can or a recycle process. That little act over and over has an enormous impact on our ability to have a sustainable planet. So what kind of conversations are we having about our own agency around race? What kind of conversations are we having about our own um, engagement with various forms of inequality? Right? Macro acts of change are those things that we could do in our systems. Right? We could change policies. We could change practices. We could change the kinds of policies that actually have a harm with young people. Third, relationships, as I already sort of mentioned. There's two kinds of relationships that we have. We have transactional relationships, and those transactional relationships are those relationships that are a function of our title. I am the principal, you are the student. I am the therapist, you are the patient. I am the executive director, you are the employee. Those are transactional relationships. And while transactional relationships are necessary and efficient, they're not enough for healing. So we need what's called transformative relationships. And tr what transformative relationships allow us to do is connect with each other's humanity. I get to know you beyond your title. I get to understand you as a human being. It means that we share some piece of ourselves. That, and when we share something about who we are, it gives permission for others to do the same. I was doing some work in, um, in a school in Texas. And they had asked us to come in and do some healing work with a staff of a school that had um, a principal that was out of control. And the superintendent didn't want to fire the principal. And all this stuff was happening to this school. And they said, can you help do some healing? And I said, no, I can't. I don't want to do that. <laughs> we decided to go ahead and, and, and work with this school. And so we went in and we began, we set up a series of processes. And we knew that there were highly technical relationships at this school. And so we created an opportunity for them to actually exchange pieces of their humanity. And as they went around, the principal, who has really sharp elbows and very smart mouth, and nobody got along with her, not the parents, not the students, not the staff, not the central office. She went around, and as everybody was giving a piece of their humanity, the, the principal shared a piece of information that she hadn't shared before with her staff. She said, you know, I've been really difficult to work with, I know, but I want everybody to know um, that uh, six months ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. And I haven't told anyone about it. Now, immediately when she said that, her staff went from anger to empathy. They saw her as a human being. And their ability to see her in a different way allowed for them to work together differently. When they were able to heal the tensions of the relationships that she had created, it allowed for them to reimagine how the possibilities for that organization or for that school. Next, meaning. Meaning is the profound discovery of who we are, where we're going, what purpose we were born to serve. Sometimes we're so close to our work. Sometimes we're so focused on our work that we never take the time to gaze and look out to understand the profound meaning that we're born to serve. Sometimes people ask me, um, why did you choose to be a professor? Or why did you choose to write? And I said, I didn't choose to work with you to be a professor. That chose me. It's a calling. It chose me. And sometimes in our work, we forget that. What meaning suggests is that we have to embrace the meaning making that we have in our work, hold it up and lift and remind ourselves of it daily so that we always are rooted in the purpose why we're serving young people. And lastly, aspirations, and this is the exploring the possibilities of our lives. I think that this is probably the most important and the most challenging. Because oftentimes, what aspiration says is that we have the right 
to see beyond the misery, the misery that we're working with. We have the ability to dream beyond the conditions that we're forced to engage in. My graduate students, I always tell them that the greatest consequences of oppression, of structural racism, of inequality, it's not just the blocked opportunities, but it is the destruction of our, of our ability to dream beyond those conditions. We can't imagine another way. And so the most courageous thing that we try to do is end it. We want to reduce, we want a violence reduction strategy. But no one wants to live or send their children to a school in a violence reduced neighborhood, right? We don't want to do that. So why do we aim, why is our aim, the highest of our aim is the reduction of misery? We strive for the thing we don't want to see. Doesn't make sense to me. So how do we then begin to have an aspirational view of our work? One that says we want to create peace. We want to create a hopeful neighbor, neighborhood. We want, we want to actually measure the things that matter, right? And so we don't only think about the reduction of misery, but we think about the creation of, our, of what we want to see. I was having a conversation with, um, again, with educators, and I, there's a tendency, again, in education that you measure a good school by um, the reduction of fights and lower, lo lower instances of bullying. And I encouraged them, I said, well, maybe you might want to think about measuring the number of hugs that young people experience every day. Maybe you want to think about the number of compliments that you've given to your staff. Maybe you can come up with a metric or a way of thinking about those things that make a difference in the quality of well-being in a, in a school or an organization that actually matter. So here's a few recommendations that we can consider in actually building a healing-centered approach. The first is we need to increase organizational supports for the staff to integrate healing practices into the day-to-day -day engagement with children and youth, right? How do we actually build opportunities for staff to learn um, healing strategies as, only, as opposed to only thinking about um, addressing pathology? This, uh, that, it's both, uh, when we say organizational supports, yeah, that's budget, but it's also time, right? How do we think about restructuring the day? How do we think about creating innovative strategies in our budget to focus on um, the ability for adults to engage in, in wellness strategies. Second, we need to build systems of support uh, to strengthen the own social emotional um, growth and, and well-being for the adults within the system. So we can't only think about engaging in professional development because we're more than just professionals, we're human beings. So we need to invest in personal development and growth as well. When we invest in personal growth and development, guess what shows up at work? A more effective employee, someone who's more innovative, someone who's more inspired, someone who's more effective. But we don't get it the other way around. When you learn another technique as a social worker, that doesn't necessarily contribute to the quality of life with your husband or your boyfriend or your children. But if we learn how to develop our humanity as a human beings, it, it allows us to show up in a different way in, the, in our workplace. Third. We need to develop and track measures of wellness and programs organizational wide, right? Again, this is, not, this is an encouragement to really be thinking, not as remedial social change, but courageous social change. Remedial social change basically means we're only aiming at the reduction of things and not looking at what we want to create. So developing and tracking measures of wellness and programs and organization-wide allows us to have more courageous measures that allow what, what the, the term that says um, what, what, me, what, you, what measures matters, right? And so if we think about measures that are more asset-driven, we get the different kind of outcomes. Uh, as I said before, we need to create healing-centered stra uh, healing strategies and not trauma-informed opportunities. And that healing center gives us a broader political view of the root causes of, of, of harm in the first place. We need to create equity-based, SEL stands for social emotional learning. And there's a way in which social emotional learning says that, that academic supports are, are important, but there are emotional developments that are, are necessary for young people as well. 
But social emotional learning, as it's currently being talked about, I argue that can be harmful. For example, if you teach a young person to be more grittier, right, grit actually says that, that somehow your inequality and how you experience it is your fault. But if you're grittier, you could just get over it. We need to be careful, as Dr. Ben talked, uh, uh, shared with us, about the language that we use. An uh, social-emotional learning, uh, equity-based social-emotional learning strategy says that we have to take in the unique needs of the social-emotional growth for young people who are, who are experiencing harm. It means, for example, young people may have shame, deep shame, for having dark skin and thick lips, or they may have shame if they're English language learner for their accent. This means that our social emotional learning strategy needs to attend to that, not get over your, your inequality. Does this make sense, right? So the unique, a, a social emotional learning strategy needs to be focused on the unique needs that young people bring into our organizations. Um, we need to support leaders with transformative change over professional development, like I've already talked about. And that transformative change allows us to reimagine our lives, not just our professions, so that our humanity can show up in profound ways to create healing opportunities for young people. I'd like to end with this quote by Michelle Alexander. For those of you who don't know Michelle Alexander, um, she is um, a legal scholar. and In my view, she is the most profound legal scholar of her time since W.E.B. Du Bois. She wrote a book called The New Jim Crow that documented the ways in which we have continued forms of slavery in our society that are continuing through the prison incarceration system. And she's written for years and years and years on the topic. And two years ago, she wrote in the New York Times that she was giving up law and enrolling into the Union Theological School in New York. And the reason she said that she was no longer practicing law and she was no longer reading or writing about the legal challenges of our society is because the problems that we face as a, as a society, she says, are not simply legal problems. And they're not even political problems or even policy problems. But at their core, America, America's problems raise profound moral questions spiritual questions about who we are, who we aim to become, and what we're willing to do now. And so I want to challenge to you, as someone challenged to me, that sometimes we ask the wrong questions. And that wrong question is, what should I do? The right question is, who should we become to transform the lives of young people? Thank you so much. Thank you. Can you stay up here? Okay, okay, cool. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Ben, for being amazing and for giving us so much to think about. We're going to take about a 10 minute break um, and we're going to do a couple of things. There's cookies and uh, coffee outside, and there's also. Uh, a couple of questions, I think they're on there. They're going to be coming up. What has resonated with you in listening to these conversations? How is it important to you? We're going to come back and there's going to be a panel discussion, so there's going to be uh, more of what we've been hearing about in a panel discussion. Thank you. Okay. Hello, hello again. Please get to your seats and we're going to be starting with our panel discussion.
So here's how it's going to go. Sean will be serving as moderator, and his panelists will include Karen Andrews. Karen is in her ninth year as principal of the Interagency Academy, a multi-campus alternative high school in the Seattle public school system. <laughs> and next to her is Sheila Capistani, and Sheila is currently a strategic advisor to King County's Best Starts for Kids initiative. And you've met Ben, and I think that's all I'm going to say, and I'm going to turn it over to Sean. Great, great. So um, just a, a little bit of a spoiler alert. We had an opportunity to uh, chat before, um, uh, before this, um, uh, the, the conference this, today, and um, I was really uh, taken by the insight that each of you brings to this work. So if you could just talk a little bit about what brings you to this work um, and, and what you do in your work, but also the insights that brings you to thinking about healing in a, in a different way. So why don't you go first, Karen? All right. Hi, everyone. Hi. I feel, I feel really a lot like um, Ben when he talked about how every day he wakes up, he feels really lucky because he loves his job. And I, I share that. That's why I've stayed in it for as long as I have. I'm in my 19th year of being a principal and my ninth year at interagency. Thanks. I have survived and I continue to. Um, and and uh, interagency is a really special place to me and to all of us in the community who, who work there. We have 12 campuses and eight of them are high school diploma track. Two of them are GED in college, and two of them serve incarcerated youth, um, the King County Juvenile Detention Center School, and we serve 18 to 21 year olds in the King County Jail. And nothing, for me, each, we, we've been able to develop programs that work for kids, and we take a new group of kids every single week, uh, between 10 and 30 new students, every Friday we start, and we uh, in t work really intensively with them to figure out who they are, what their vision for their life is, what their, you know, and then break that down into goal setting, um, and what kind of support can we offer them to meet those goals, and we judge our work on do we help them get to the place that they want to go? It's not about test scores, it's not about um, on-time graduation rates and all the things that the, the government wants us to measure. It's about how can we help this person, um, this human in front of us who's had a lot of really tough things happen in their lifetime. Every single, every single kid who comes to us comes with a story that is uh, that could really overwhelm um, if, you, uh, if you look at the story as defining them. But what we really try to do is, is combine all the things that have happened to them to this point with their vision for their future, and, and then, you know, be it, we're a bridge. We're, we're really a bridge for that. Um, I'd say about, uh, when I started at interagency and I, you know, three years into it, I saw, I think I always sort of had an intuitive sense that, as all of you do too, I'm sure that uh, before there was a name for trauma-informed or the ACEs study, we knew that people, people's behaviors are a manifestation of, what, um, of what's happened to them along the way, and we need to be responsive to that. And, um, but when, the, when this study came out, and I saw it as this major public health crisis that we were only talking to providers about. We weren't actually talking to kids about how they can uh, overcome and grow and heal. And, um, and, and at our school, we're able to create environments that really, really facilitate that kind of healing um, and, and talk directly to kids because we, have, we serve a lot of kids. We serve almost 2,000 kids a year, students a year. Um, and, Yet, because of the structures that we've put in place, everyone is really known, cared for, and, and loved um, every single day. That's our goal. We, we really look for that, that belonging, and I think that for us, that is, that's the basis for beginning this, this healing with the students. 
Thanks, Karen. Sheila. So um, I want to start off, I, I realized as I was walking around the room that I have a lot of county colleagues here today, so I just want to give a shout out to you. Um, I feel humbled every day to work with these people um, at the county, so shout out to you all. Yay. I also have notes with me in part because like my mind was blown by both of these men today. Um, and whenever that happens, I always lose my focus because I want to go in 50 different directions. Um, so I will try and focus some of that now, but when we're in conversation, I would love to just flow with whatever we need to flow with. Um, so in terms of the work that I do, I am the strategic advisor for children and youth um, at the county. And the last three years, my main body of work has been um, sort of envisioning and making a reality uh, best starts for kids and making sure that we bring on a team of folks that, that can help implement that reality. Um, but my job also expands to getting the entire county to begin looking at how we serve children and youth differently. And that was really why I took the job. Well, that and I loved being thinking $400 million and we get to direct how that goes. So that was an amazing thing to have an opportunity to do. I won't lie. Um, but at the county, I actually have, um, within the hierarchy, I've got three bosses that I report to. I report to the county executive. I report to the head of the Department of Community of Human Services, and I re report to the head of our health department. So between those, those three power brokers, those are who I see as my, my hierarchical supervisors. But I really feel like what we're trying to do with the county, what we're trying to do with Best Starts for Kids, that I actually report to my community. I feel like when I took this job that I came um, from my community and that that's who I feel the responsibility for. And even on a deeper level than that, I have got three children that I report to. I think about the world that we are creating right now and that we are trying to leave for them and it motivates me every day. Um, and I also wanna give a shout out if there is any of you in the room. I started my career um, when I was 21 years old. I was, I was trained as a doula. I have assisted over 200 babies into this world and women. So doulas in the room. And I know there's a few of you, um, including the one who, who was actually my midwife and caught my babies is in this room. So hi, Michelle. <laughs> so, um, so that's that, Sada. I want to tell you very quickly about Best Starts for Kids. For those of you that are unfamiliar or not quite sure, Best Starts for Kids is a $400 million levy that was passed by you all three and a half years ago. Um, that makes me nervous because we're, we're a six-year levy, so if it was three and a half years ago, I only have about two and a half more years. Um, before we have to be thinking in the next year about renewal. But it's 400 million, which is about 65 million um, property tax every single year. And when I first came to the county, the way that we were envisioning Best Starts before it was approved was that it was gonna be a prevention and early intervention initiative. So I had already come from being a doula, I had been working deeply in the community, and I came to the county and I said, we cannot, as we heard earlier, just always keep thinking about what we want to prevent what we want to intervene in. We have got to keep our eye on the prize. We have to be able to create some sense of what we're aiming for, not what we're just trying not to do. Um, and so using the language of the county and, and public health, I said, you know, we need to add promotion to that. So Best Starts for Kids is about promoting well-being, preventing some of the things that can happen to young people, and intervening and wrapping around kids early um, and families when, when things kind of go awry. So promotion, prevention, and early intervention. Over the last two years, we have tried to take all of the words that the county uses, which they use a lot because we're government, um, to describe our, our vision and our mission. And after all the folks who are involved in this and um, doing all of this work, we have four words that we're aiming for with Best Starts for Kids. Our vision is healthy, happy, safe, and thriving for all of our children, for all of our youth and young people, for all of our families, and for our communities. And can you imagine a government that commits itself to healthy, happy, safe, and thriving? So that means a different sense of accountability for what we're doing, and it means a different set of, of strategies that we use and policies that we use to get there. If we maintain that as our commitment, then we're not just about saying, stop the school to prison pipeline, but saying that is our journey on the way to healthy, happy, safe, and thriving. So what do we want for these young people that are interacting with our system? We want more than just not sending them to prison. That's a super low bar. We shouldn't even have to talk about that, but seriously, that is a super low bar. We want all of our children to aim in this direction. So 
that was inspiring to me to be able to come and start to actualize some of this on our, our levels of systems. So BSK, we have a lot of community partners. The vast majority of our dollars went out into our community. We have, um, are now working with and engaged with over 600 community-based organizations in our region, and about 60% of them have never been funded by the county before. So that's a remarkable shift in the way that we have done things. The other part about Best Starts for Kids is now that we're heavy into the implementation and have gotten our dollars out, we can turn our attention towards making, looking at the systems and where can we advocate for change and where can we do that both internally as an institution and look at the system that we work in and change. So we'll, we'll have opportunity to talk more about that, but how do we talk about what we, what we talked about today towards the work that I'm doing? So we, we hold this vision. I'm gonna tell you what keeps me up at night. I'll get a little personal. Um, there's lots that keeps me up at night because I'm not gonna get that super personal. Um, <laughs> nobody panic. Um, but as we're talking about the um, having a healing-centered systems, as you mentioned that, healing-centered systems, it's not just about recognizing that we need that, but how do we have the political will and the institutional will to do that work? Sometimes I feel like we operate as Best Starts for Kids in this totally different way than the rest of the county does, and that if we go away, that will go away. So how do we make the bridge to working within an institution that we both have to work within um, and try and change it as we're trying to do that, and try and get contracts out on time, while at the same time saying, the way you want us to contract doesn't make any sense. Right? How do we do all of that work? So we are deeply engaged in that, which again, I'm, I'm like bowing down to my county employees because we are deeply engaged in that conversation. Um, so that's one of the things. One of the things that inspires me actually came from my friend, Dr. Ben here, who sits on our um, Children, Youth, and Advisory Board. When we were first starting talking about Best Starts for Kids and talking about we want to shift to what do we want to create and not just what we want to um, not have there. Because Best Starts is, is government, we have to be good stewards of the public dollar. Everything needs to be measured so that we can prove that we made the changes that we said we were going to. Um, and I remember one day we, were, we had asked these um, folks in the community who'd been helping us design Best Starts for Kids to come to an all-day retreat and slog through all of this with us so that we could have a plan, that we could pass through city council, yada, yada, yada. And so we talked about measurement. It's really easy to find measures for intervention. It's really easy to set your sights on, on particular measures. And at one point, Ben was like, can we just stop for a second? Like, how are we gonna measure joy? Like, let's talk about that. Let's talk about happiness for these kids. Let's talk about joy. And how are we gonna measure that? And how, as you mentioned, are we gonna measure wellness? So this is our year to really grapple with that, with Best Starts for Kids, is, is it's really easy after you have implemented something for a year or two or three to slide back into the way that things are typically done. And so the other thing that keeps me up at night is, again, how do I keep an entire system's eye on the prize? They were excited to vote for it, but now the rubber hits the road, it's getting hard, it's getting difficult, they want measurable results. They want us to change everybody's life because now we're gonna to have to renew the levy and it's been six years and, and how did you change the world? And if you didn't, we shouldn't be funding you. So thinking long term about some of these really big issues and again, we may address some of them as we go on. Thanks, Sheila. Ben. Thank you. Um, I just wanna, my mind is still so swimming from your words and I just wanna um, say again how much I appreciated your presentation, your, your thoughts, and the, the compassion and passion that you bring to your work. I just honor you. And so I'm gonna over metaphorize, metaphor, I don't know what the word is. Um, in the same way that uh, you talked about, there's a self-healing and self-giving and self-healing process. Uh, People who sit on stages before you uh, need the same kind of support and healing as they talk about or as they you know, we sort of want to see. And I feel uh, a sense of gratitude to this group uh, because you actually restore and feed uh, me in a really, really important way. Uh, and I hope you feel that about some of the people that you know around you as well. That's such an important piece. So I'm gonna name this kind of a healing event in addition to a learning event. Thanks to the way you think about that. I think about 
how you approach your work with such a centering of youth and such a focus on love. And um, I will hold that so strongly in the way I want to move forward in the work I do. And I will always admire and listen to every word that, that you say. But this <laughs> hopefulness and joy and love and healing, uh, those are powerful words. And I'm going to keep thinking for days and days about, about this, this day today. My work right now, um, I'm thinking about a lot, is uh, we're trying to build a new clinic. And it's partly out of a terrible necessity, gentrification and displacement of families out of uh, a very a beautiful uh, s neighborhood that was um, the heart of Seattle's African-American community for so long. And before that, I think um, a Jewish community. Before that, I think uh, um, part of the Asian community. Um, and now families spread out far and wide, less connected to the churches, to the barber shops and salons, less connected to the places where they find support and uh, joy. And we have to think a lot about how to respond to that change. Uh, and with that necessity has also comes this opportunity to rethink the way we model care um, and the way we do things uh, in our clinic. Um, and so we've been trying very hard to create spaces that are um, inspiring. There are three themes about the clinic that we're trying to build actually physical space around. One of them is uh, a lot of transparency. We want young people to see uh, people working together in teams uh, trying to do things. Uh, what it would be like to have young people just see how your department works together and suddenly have somebody say, I want to be Sheila. But not just Sheila, I want to be part of the team that works with Sheila. Um, what does it look like to create transparency in your work so powerful that every, every piece of your day is a mentoring and a inspiring moment? It's actually making our staff nervous because they, they don't always want to be on stage. Um, so we're really working through some really interesting challenges there. Second is um, um, how do we integrate our work in a much more meaningful way so that we are not siloing our approach to care the way the healthcare system wants to silo it, as if your teeth aren't part of your body or your mind isn't connected to the rest of your body. So we're really trying to be intentionally integrated and uh, integrated in the work in a way that actually builds more time into care, partly because a lot of our visits uh, never end with, that's an ear infection. It, they often, um, the last comment is, by the way, uh, I'm homeless because I'm escaping domestic violence or something really important that needs that is the most important reason to be working with somebody that day. How to create that space, your comments about time as a resource, an asset that is named and categorized and valued and built into your work is something that we're trying to do and is a struggle every day. The third piece of this uh, clinic we're trying to build is uh, on this motif of a village. And um, I'm getting downright like um, uh, concrete about that vision, uh, the middle of the clinic actually being a town square that isn't so much about the practical execution of work on a computer or something, but where patients and staff and folks mix and hang out and just talk about what's going on and um, like, a, like a town square. And our, our rooms, our clinic rooms, we even have, uh, will have like front porches, stoops. I grew up in DC and the stoop was where stuff happened, where you learned where you got, I got spanked sometimes, where you had, um, <laughs> where you felt your connectedness to the people around you in a way that was really valuable. And so how do you create an environment that says community, that says mentoring and transparency, and that says we are all kind of working together in this, in this way? I could say more, but um, that's what's been on my mind just from, from your question. So we're gonna just, we're gonna just have a conversation. Um, so we had an opportunity to talk, like I said before. Um, so we all work in different systems. And those systems um, can sometimes be barriers to well-being for the folks that we want to work with. Um, I had an opportunity to, um, I was thinking about issues of how do you reimagine systems, and it usually begins with different forms of measurement, and I came across a website by the city of Santa Monica. And they went, the city of Santa Monica did a study, and they said, we're not gonna measure the quality of living in our city by the, you know, looking at the reduction of violence and, 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 and spread of HIV. They said we're gonna measure well-being in the city. It's, it's a wonderful website, check it out. So I wanted to, my question is um, sort of an upstream downstream question. And that is, what are some of the upstream challenges 
and upstream possibilities that you see in Seattle in fostering and ushering uh, uh, strategies for well-being. This is also really on my mind these days around reimagining uh, our work, and it is a huge challenge because the healthcare system um, wants to measure and measure in a specific way and measure in a way that is way downstream and name institutionally what that measurement is. Uh, and that's, um, that is a, a barrier to really thinking about things in an innovative and new way. Um, we want to uh, create a space maybe where more of the time the community actually names what we, what we look at and what we uh, think about and how we measure. Um, we want to create the space for stories to be the, the quantum of measurement as opposed to maybe uh, p-values and <laughs> bar charts like I was showing. Um, we want to sort of uh, transcend that a little bit and that uh, pretty anchored in a healthcare system that is so not only broken but misdirected that it, it becomes really hard. Um, I'm inspired uh, because I learn of possibilities from the people around me, uh, especially the community that I work with. I see uh, the sense of uh, hope and possibility and I wanna capture that and name that and change the way uh, our system thinks about what it means to be doing good work. Um, I'm inspired by the people I work next to every day who continue to do just incredible work despite some of the barriers and challenges. And um, I'm mostly inspired by Seattle and it's a great desire to be a continuously learning space and place and to uh, envision things that are better. Uh, I'm challenged by our community's um, strong space of good intention and maybe not as strong a space in actual intentionality, in actions. Uh, and I, I struggle, someone was just teaching me uh, today about how to really carry more of a message of intentional action, not just really good philosophy and idea. Good intentions without intentionality is a very big challenge, I think, for us regionally. I also think, uh, not in this arena, but in some other spaces, Seattle in this area is kind of a little bit nimby about um, want good things to happen, but I don't want it to actually impact me in any particular way. So let, let me push that a little bit further because in our conversation, um, you know, we're in Seattle, this is, um, there's a tendency, which is in Seattle, but also in, uh, around the country, where there's largely white service providers working in communities of color. And system, when we talk about system, there's a way in which we think about system as some technical, you know, you know external set of rules and regulations, but it's actually people. So let's, 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 drop, let's drop it down a little bit to what are some of the challenges to um, transformation in some of these upstream systems? What needs to happen in Seattle to actually usher some of the kind of caring, courageous kinds of policy changes that you, that you mentioned in your presentation? So I'm, I'm gonna go very, very deep on that because I think that there are some things that, are, that we can address, but um, it, it, listening to you, inspired me to think about, um, about it in this way. But so at the county, we always, because we're government, we have public dollars, we're always thinking about how we measure things, we always have to think about what goals are we setting. One of the things that I think holds us back in this country is actually our ways of talking about disparities and comparing each other to one another. And ultimately, when we talk about disparities, we're comparing everybody to white people. And as the county, we center whiteness. If you're doing better than white people, you're considered to have good outcomes. If you're doing worse than white people, you're considered to have bad outcomes. Now that presupposes that white people actually have super, super, super good outcomes. <laughs> and we all wanna be them, right? So, so that's, as people are laughing, that's faulty. Um, but it limits what we can do. So then the piece that answers your question a little bit is I have, I have been talking about this for the last decade. Like we need to uncenter whiteness. We actually need to talk about optimal health and not just the disparities between us. Um, that I believe the reason why we have things like a high maternal death rate, which you mentioned in this country, is because we like to believe that, that because the system itself says that white is right and everything else has to come around that. 
What I have found as I have begun challenging this, um, and heartbreakingly so, when I have said, look, what I want for my community is better than the outcomes that a lot of what white people are experiencing right now. And in fact, I want better outcomes than what white people for white people are experiencing right now. Um, and so whether people come along or not, I want to create programs that goes into community and say, community, you define where, where do you want to go? What's your North Star and how are we going to get there? I have actually had over the years, um, folks say to me, white people say, well, how come you're talking about them being better than us? Like, how can you invest in their health outcomes getting better than our outcomes? And I think underneath that is a deep racist idea that says white rises and then the rest of us can rise. White rises and then the rest of us can rise. But when we talk about health outcomes for people of color that may exceed white people, it starts to make the, the system nervous. And that, that I think we have to begin to look deeply into ourselves as a nation and say, are we really looking at this both from a, a standpoint that talks about sort of supremacy and what we're used to and being taught, but also a zero sum game? that does it have to be that you can't get better until I get better, or if you get better, somehow that means I'm not. So there's a lot wrapped up in that. Ooh, you're getting deep, you're getting deep. <laughs> so I know there's a lot of folks sort of thinking um, there, in, there's a way to think about addressing racism cognitively, right? Like, I know racism exists. You know, I've read Michelle Alexander and you know, this. What needs to happen? What do folks need to ponder? What do folks need to wrestle with to decenter whiteness, not only in the systems in their work, but, but in their lives? What do they need to, to be thinking about? That's to. Karen? I'm going to say one thing because I just went off. I'm just going to. Yeah. Um, we talked about this, and maybe you all can pick up on this, but what do we need to do is we need to, as you addressed earlier, and you had that sign that said human. We need to come to start at our common humanity. We need to start there and we need to join there and then we can look at our social construct. That is not to say that, you know, we are the world, we are. We don't need to do that. I am talking about deep, deep holding one another's humanity and if we can hold each other there, then we can have the courage to address the social construct. Too many people are living in the social construct and I think a lot of that's where a lot of the Seattle way of being, the Northwest way of being, I'm a good person, please don't challenge me. Because you're living in the social construct, rather into the human, like, oh God, we put this system in that's hurting you, and that hurts me. Like, it hurts my heart, and so I wanna do whatever I can, and if I'm a part of that, please let me know, right? We do that with the people that we love. So why not with the people that we love? Right. Right. I, as, the white person up here. I um, <laughs> feel a little pressure, but uh, that's good pressure. Good pressure. That's how we grow. Uh, I I want to say that I completely agree with everything that that has been said, and I think that as we saw the data that Dr. Ben shared with us about gentrification in Seattle and how whiteness is becoming even more prevalent than it already was in Seattle, which seemed almost impossible, but it has happened, you know, and, and that also, not just whiteness, but also wealth, too, with all of our new, with Amazon and, and other companies. And so, you know, it's forced and pushed people in all different places, and it makes it harder uh, uh, to be in close proximity to people who have different lives than we do. And I think, you know, Brian Stevenson, who I don't know if you all have read Just Mercy, but um, it's an incredible book. And, and, and he does a lot of other work other than um, is in his book. But he talks a lot about proximity and how we need to, we need to walk side by side in kinship with each other and with those who've had a very different journey than we have. And as Seattle gentrifies and changes, we as white people are the ones who are going to need to. I mean, I, we have to put ourselves in positions where we're less comfortable and be in close proximity if we want things to change, to, to um, if we want to be a part of, of the solution, not continue to exist thinking that because we voted for Obama that we don't have racist um, <laughs> tendencies. And yeah, I'll stop there. 
just wanted to add. So there's, there's some things that I think are also pragmatic. I think you spoke to the soul, you spoke to the environment, and I think there's um, policy pragmatism that we could really be inserting. And this is, I'm saying this maybe on behalf of both of our work with uh, Best Starts for Kids. Um, I put that equity statement up there, um, which is a long statement, um, and it is intentionally uh, a driving tool. Uh, and we have used it as a driving tool. And one example is, um, you can take every one of those statements and turn it into an inquiry. Uh, has the work that you're planning to do been truly driven by, informed, and centered uh, in the community that you're serving, as an example? Each one of those statements, are you, uh, in this project, actually shifting power from the power base um, it, by doing this work? Um, are, are there unintended consequences in the work you're doing? Are you actually building the community that you, uh, find, that you hold up as beloved? So I think, and we've used that. We've used that to interrogate um, the way uh, the, um, the juvenile detention system is, uh, has been functioning in this county. We've used that to talk about where we want to invest. We've used that to uh, really um, dangerously and powerfully interrogate our own work and make sure that it is holding to that value. And I wonder if every organization had to put every decision they had through a litmus test of questions like that, what would you come up with? I think you would be transforming um, whether you had the hearts and souls in, space, in that place or not. And I partly say that because I think that is the ultimate important work, but I was also um, at one meeting once many, many years ago uh, with a hospital that I won't name that uh, ran afoul of, of some real and uh, real intangible racism in their work. And then they met with the local NAACP. And uh, I sat at this table while uh, the NAACP person asked, um, you know, um, what are you doing in your policies to change this environment? And the answers were all about, well, we, we hold meetings and we have some conferences. Uh, somebody like maybe Dr. Ben comes and talks to us about how good it would be to be different. And, uh, <laughs> and then he, this person just sort of smiled for a second and then said, you know, I, I wonder what would have happened in the 1870s if, and 60s if we had just asked everybody to stop racism. It wasn't um, asking people to change their behavior is sometimes not sufficient. You actually need policies and rules and laws that enforce a change. And that is, that is the way major change happens. I think it's a both and, but I also want to acknowledge there's some practical, pragmatic work. If you had the courage to do it, it would make incredible changes. So let me, let me um, um, build off that question. So what I'm hearing is, is that well-being is really a function of sort of this broader political environment, right? Gentrification affects well-being, racism, all these things affect well-being. So in Oakland, um, this, is, this, this question deals with race, well-being, and cannabis. So um, <laughs> I guess we're in the right place, right? <laughs> so, so in California, we passed the cannabis, um, uh, recreational cannabis. And uh, in Oakland, there were an enormous, a, a high percentage of young men of color who um, were affected by the sale of cannabis. And they removed the barrier, for, so they allowed them to come out of jail for, that in, for incarceration. But now the legalization meant that, means that the very act of them selling now become, become a legitimate business. So the city of Oakland actually passed an equity law that says that if you were incarcerated and lived in this particular neighborhood, you actually get to, you move ahead of all of the other people to get a license to sell cannabis. And, and for the investors that come into Oakland that are opening up cannabis shops, they have to mentor you and give you a loan, right? So it was a pretty courageous equity Pragmatic. statement. Pragmatic, right? So this question is about if you had to have a major policy transformation relevant to well-being for young people of color here in Seattle, what kinds of courageous changes would you make to some of the policies? That's a good question, wasn't it? 
I'll, I'll say something practical that's not quite as uh, well formed as, as what um, Dr. June Wright just said, but, but I think a lot about the amount of money that we spend to incarcerate a young person in King County. We spend almost, a, if they were in for a full year, we'd spend about $140,000 a year. And if we um, look at the amount that, the, that a school district can reimbur ask for reimbursement for a meal, for two meals, breakfast and lunch, um, they can reimburse, it's about $5 a day, right? Which comes out to, I don't know, like $800 a year for all the meals for, uh, for a kid. And if we're looking at the food that kids are served, nutrition, which we know is a huge, huge piece of wellness, we give the poorest kids the worst food mm -hmm. and we fight and I watch it time and time again, our kids, we, we tell our students we have a really, I mean people would call it a truancy problem, I would call it something completely different. I would say our kids have to go through so many challenges to get to school. Let's peel that back and see what's going on and all the things and then when they get there, the first thing that happens to them usually is somebody says, oh, you're late again. You know, you're about to get dropped from this class. It's all negative, negative, negative. And then they say, I'm hungry. Well, you missed breakfast because you were late. Wait till lunch. You get to lunch and you see a sandwich that maybe looks like the color of the foods. None of them are the natural color that they were before. It, it's not good. And it's the same thing you had yesterday and the day before. And if we want to flip this around um, and, and feed our kids and work with organizations that do, and, you know, we have gardening and we grow healthy foods and our kids learn that, and yet we are unable to take on, or un, not unable actually, we're unwilling as a community to take on things like nutrition services and uh, the unions that hold in place bad food and really terrible nutrition for the kids who deserve, not just need, all kids need it, but deserve. They just deserve better and we could do that. I mean, it would cost nothing compared to the cost of incarcerating one of these kids later. So I would love some help on that if anyone wants to jump in. Um. So you would, you would shift, shift juvenile incarceration dollars to nutrition dollars in the schools? Well, I'm saying that we, yes, but I, I would, I'm saying that this is a very small cost, mm -hmm. and, but, it, but it takes courage and banding together to take on the systems that are in place in my school district. So, you know, I'm getting some pushback from that. I don't mind that, but what I'm really wanna see is us looking at, there are things that aren't that hard to do, that we could do, and we're, you know, and we're willing to pay $140,000 to incarcerate someone just for a short term. Yeah. And instead of putting it all back into getting, you know, wellness and healing in kindergarten and pre-K and all the way through, like what you guys are doing with Best Arts and, and, and we're trying to do, but really putting that on the early end. Um, so, and, and setting up a system where in order for a kid to end up at a school that says that they love them in the end, I'm not saying we're the only one, and that really embraces them and helps them figure out where they go, they have to fail how many times first, right? That's not fair either. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna jump from being pragmatic last time to being uh, aspirational and a little bit out there, but um, Part for me when I think about healing, uh, it is wed pretty tightly to justice. Mm -hmm. And the piece of healing that we still don't talk too much about is reparation. Mm. And um, I think I, we have to start with some conversations and then some actions that are really about reparation. Reparation for this land that we stole, reparation for the lives that we stole and the lives that didn't, didn't even make it to uh, this continent. Mm -hmm. there, is a, there is a bill that is due um, and that bill stands in the way of healing, mm -hmm. in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, we need to talk seriously about reparation. Reparation could show up in so many different ways. I loved your example of flipping the priority pyramid. I wondered if the healthcare field, um, with every new promising best technology, it's applied first to communities that have been marginalized and oppressed historically. 
uh, if we really flipped the resource allocation in, in, a, in a holistic way, and we named that as, as part, at least, of reparation. I wouldn't even go too much further than that because I think it's the communities themselves that should start to name what reparation looks like. But this wealth that is this United States um, is enjoyed by the people who had nothing to do with the creation of it. Hey, hey. Sheila, but you have $400 million. What you yes. gonna do? Which, which I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna talk about that. I, I am actually gonna talk, not what I'm gonna do, but that $400 million. So I'm gonna get super practical here. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll switch this off. And, I, and um, this is something that sounds very wonky, but I would love to have a community behind this. We talk about political will, there's also public will. And when we talk about how the county spends its dollars that are sort of the general fund county dollars, there's a lot about public will in that too that's not just about political will. So Best Starts for Kids came about because the county executive was faced with a budget where he was gonna be spending another 75% of his budget on incarceration, substance use, and mental health and mental illness. 75% of the general fund dollars for King County goes towards the downstream and so the idea was let's do a levy where we can get out in front, where we can start to do some of this. And I actually think that was brilliant and I love that we have this investment. What would happen if we said, we need to flip our general fund. We need to have the dollars that the county can rely on, not a levy that needs to be renewed every six years, but actual steady funding going towards health and wellness, right? What would happen then? Again, commitment. So this is a huge issue and it is, it's political because it comes to our politicians from constituents. You know, what are you spending my hard on tax dollars on? So there has to be this, this public piece to this very sort of governmental wonky conversation about what do we spend the dollars that we always know are gonna be there on. I truly do not believe, and I feel comfortable saying this, although it's in opposition to the politicians I work for because I've said it on camera before, um, I believe that we need to start shifting some of the dollars that we invest in our juvenile legal system, it is not a juvenile justice system, that we invest in our juvenile legal system and start funding some of the types of things that we fund under Best Starts for Kids, and let's find, to, and then reprogram what we're doing in that way. It is the only way that we're gonna do a shift. Repar reparations and, and shifting dollars and transforming systems. So this is, um, there's a way that we think about change that is technical and mechanical. I'm curious about the role of spirituality in this work, in transformation, in healing. What are your thoughts about your, 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 ex your experience or your, your thoughts about the role of spirituality in this work? Um, this question kind of came from the audience, and, and it's really about there's, there's a way that we can engage in change that somehow is removed from our humanity. You said earlier um, political will, um, and it seems to me that there's something more fundamental that, is, that also is important in thinking about the role of healing and, and, and systems transformation. So I just wanted to hear, hear your thoughts about that. I mean, I, I, when I think of spirituality, I think of sitting in circle with kids and I think of listening and the true deep listening that makes you feel like you are, the person you're listening to is the only person in the world and how that gift to yourself to actually just be so present and, and hearing them um, creates a sort of um, kinship that, that can't be replicated by large systems and uh, um, it's, about, it's about building humanity and connection and belonging. Um, I'm not, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not just because I work in a public school, but I've, I'm not an expert on spirituality. I try to, I try to see connection and kinship in that way. But that's, that's spirituality, that spirituality, right? Like to, to, to create a connection and sit with someone to connect them with them in ways that is not just a function of being a principal, right? It's, it's, it's a form of spirituality. 
Well, and I call that the, the spirituality of our mutual amazingness. <laughs> I think we need to come from that place, and I agree with you that it, it is beyond just our social emotional well being and our intellectual well being or our practical well being. There is something very, very deep about being human beings together. And when we are willing to go to that place, then we really do see how amazing we are as human beings. And you're talking about this connection that we can even make that connection blows my mind. Like that, and, and so what it comes down to me is the, the word that, that um, I love, the four letter word, love. Mm -hmm. Like big L love. To me that that is the basis of spirituality. How that comes through religion is a person's personal thing. But how spirituality comes through us, I believe is sort of about us as human beings. Um, and so I, in the current position that I'm in, because again, you know, I was a doula, so anyone hearing me talk about love, of course, <laughs> right, as a doula, but how about as a strategic advisor or as a policy analyst talking about love, mm -hmm. right? So under all of my work with the county and what I talk to people about is what is love as public policy? What does that look like? Again, how does that change the accountability of government? And that to me is, I mean, spirituality in government, wow. wow. Um, and I would add the reason why we can do that is to get back to Ben's geekiness of we the people. <laughs> I came, I, I work in lo local government and I usually last, I, this is my fourth time working for lo local government. I usually last about two years bef before I can't do it anymore. Um, I've been in the county for almost four years, so that speaks to something about my belief in, and um, that we're actually gonna shift something here. But I keep coming back because I actually believe in um, what was in the Gettysburg Address, which I memorized in the fifth grade, um, of the people, by the people, for the people. That is what government is, actually. And that is love as public policy. And if we think about that, it's about us people and how we've organized ourselves in a system, then we have the power to change that system and we have the ability to, to get um, others on board with us. So. Good, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in that, same, in that same vein of sort of thinking about love and public policy and transformation, um, this, uh, this question also comes from the audience. And if you could share with us um, something that shifted you, an experience that you've had with a young person, a patient, a community that you're working with, that really shifted your own thinking or pushed you to reimagine or reconsider or reposition how you approach healing and well being. I'm going to bend that slightly and say, I think that happens almost every day. Um, it, when I think about that, it, it is, uh, it's, a, it's a frequent, if not constant, experience um, if you're awake, right? And if you're, if you're listening and looking. Well, that gets to, you know, that, that, that last point, if you're awake, there was another question <laughs> here, which is, what are our blind spots, yeah. right? So you're, what does that mean for you if you're awake? Um, I think there's a bit of living your life intentionally, being as present in moments as, uh, as they deserve and as you should. Uh, I think uh, that uh, listening is not an automatic thing, it's actually a honed and developed and um, uh, multiplied skill. Um, you might have it to some extent inherently, but it can always be built upon. Um, I think that, uh, that, uh, that we can break our own hubris uh, so so well and so often. I mean, you have me, all of you have me thinking about things in ways that uh, I didn't come into this room thinking about some of them in that way. I have so many lessons that Liz Thomas, that nurse practitioner who really did teach me about about community health and what it meant to be a doctor. The number of times I was in, uh, I was in a room with um, a mom and kids uh, uh, when I was early in my practicing. She happened to be Somali and the kids were 10 and 11. And she, sa she said, uh, you're not going to see these kids for a couple of years because um, they are going to be going for a couple of years of school in Kenya where we have connections. And I thought I was being smart. I was like, oh, I know what this is about. And I said, I get it. You got brown young males who are about to be teenagers, and this society is unsafe for them. The police might shoot them. It just feels like an unsafe environment for you to raise brown-skinned males. I, I understand that completely, that you're making the sacrifice to go across this ocean. She just looked at me for a while and smiled and then started shaking her head and she said, uh, very kindly, she said, you seem like a very nice doctor. 
Uh, <laughs> you know how that's going to go, right? <laughs> but you're completely wrong. Uh, I'm taking the boys to Kenya because the schools are better there. There's a whole lot in that. Yeah, yeah. wow, wow. Sheila, what about you? You know, I, um, for some reason I've got my, the, the birthing people on my mind today and babies. I think it was that picture of the baby that you showed me. <laughs> I mean, probably I'm also ready to be a grandma, but um, <laughs> not yet. My kids are not oh. old enough, but I am old enough. You hold it here first. Let's qualify. <laughs> Um, but I, I'm actually thinking a lot of my doula practice um, was really geared towards young parents. And I, re I remember it was hard because the disrespect that was leveled at the young people that I worked with. And these are young women, you know, 16, 17, 18, who were bringing new life into the world. And the things that the doctors said that they thought that they could say to them, I just, it makes me so angry even now. My blood pressure is growing, going up. But, I was at a birth that was a particularly difficult birth, and it was a particularly mean staff. I mean, just flat out inhuman meanness towards this young woman, um, including when the doctor walked in and she's full on in the middle of a contraction, and he says, oh, you're a bit young to be having a baby, don't you think? And you know, if you're a doula in a hospital, you have no status. Um, but I looked at the doctor and I just said, oh, <laughs> you're a little bit late in asking that question, aren't you? <laughs> and just back off. But at the, at the end of, um, the, a lot of that happened. The baby had just been born. It was super hard. She's very young. She grabs, she has her baby. And I, I had this idea of trying to wrap, wrap um, an invisible sanctuary um, when I am a doula. And if it has been a hostile environment that I, I can wrap, it's just me and the young person. But anyone's welcome into that space if they're willing to come as sanctuary, right? So... Um, anyone who is a doula who thinks that I'm throwing myself on ladies, I'm not. But, but trying to create this environment where you... So with her, it was just me and her. Everyone else was just such negative energy coming at her. And I wanted this baby to feel welcome. But she looked at her baby, and she looked up at me with this look on her face, and she said, um, she's beautiful, isn't she? And the question was not just a statement. It was actually a question. And I realized she needed... Just think of how about deep that is. She felt it. She had hope in that moment, but she had doubt that anyone else saw the beauty of her baby and the beauty of that moment. And this was about 15 years ago. That has stayed with me absolutely at the core of a lot of what I do. I have a story that sticks with me a lot that taught me a lot about race in my work because I've worked for a lot of years, uh, 16 of my year, well, 18 of my 29, 17 of my 19 years in, <laughs> let's be specific, I don't wanna be fact-checked, like, you know, but, uh, but um, in, in schools and communities where I have definitely not been the, the uh, where, where white is, there are not very many white kids. And um, in, at, when I was principal at Madrona K-8, I was uh, sort of, I won't go into the story of really what all happened. I was sort of forced out of there for not embracing the gentrification. And, and it was a really uh, sort of traumatic experience for a lot of people, the kids and me and the staff. And I remember going around and talking to, to the different classes. And I was in a second grade class. And I mean, these, the kids, my kids in school were so, I was so attached. It was. I really viewed every kid there as my kid, and I knew them, and I knew their families, and I loved them. And and I was t telling that to this group of second graders, and um, and I said, you know, I feel so privileged as a white woman that you have let me into your lives, and you've trusted me. And this little boy started crying, and he raised his hand, and he said, you're not white, are you? <laughs> And I, and I looked at him, I mean, I'm like, not just white, I'm like Nordic white, you know, like, I was like, uh, you know, Jay Shot. I, I, and, and I said, yes, and he said, and he was just crying, he said, he said, but Ms. Andrews, you love us, and, and I will never, ever, ever forget that moment, wow. just of how profound, there's so much there in what I learned, um, what I learned from that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
That's deep. Yeah, the, you know, these moments um, shift us um, in ways that we don't, we don't necessarily, if we're not woke, um, to, to, to really pay attention to. We had a conversation earlier that I want to, I want to have here, and and it, because I, I think it's useful, I think it's really helpful. I mean, it's two two part conversation. One is this question of courage, right? Which is there are people here that are believing, um, you know, soon, go back to work, go back to their neighborhoods, and will say that was a great thing, that was a great session we went to, right? And we'll experience something that's gonna require courage or it's gonna be the same. And then the second is this question about, I think you call it perseverance or stamina. stamina. Yeah. And there, the, and I'm gonna set it up for you and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna shift it over to you. The question of stamina, which is, there's a way in which we think about exceptionals, like Ben is exceptional. He was strong to get through racism and all young black men should do the same thing. And there's another way to think about stamina that you brought up. And I think it was really key and critical for folks to understand the distinctions between how we think about what, it, what is required for well-being and success, to, be, to have well-being in a system that is trying to harm you. Does that, do you want to just take it from here? I might just be rambling, I'm sorry, but. No, no, you're right there, and I'm trying to remember exactly what I said that, that you want to get at. Because uh, what, I, what I can say is our conversation started because I, um, I had said that every year I sort of choose a personal word and this year, my personal word was stamina, and it just came to me. And we had a really deep conversation about what that means to whom. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was, there was an element where I thought, OK, I'm telling you, the two of you, that my word is stamina. Because I know, as African American people, you'll know the depth of what I mean by that stamina. What we brought up was that sometimes that stamina is um, that idea of exceptionalism, that idea of look he did it and therefore all the rest of you should be able to do it is really tied to what you all discussed earlier around resilience and grit and what are the, the, the places where we can fall with that. So when I talk about the stamina that I need, it is the day to day getting through the, the constant sort of questioning and assault to my sense of humanity um, and what does it mean to say, okay, I'm gonna walk with love, but it, and I didn't say this, but it reminds me of the bumper sticker that says, Jesus loves you and I'm trying to, <laughs> right? So what does it mean? Because that's the person I want to be, is to, is to move with love and compassion. And yet what I get at me is not love and compassion. So how do I have the strength to stand and to keep going and to keep saying it's about love, it's about love, it's about love when we're getting something else that's different. That doesn't make me um, necessarily make me look exceptional on the outside because every single one of us is doing that every single day. Every person of color that you are seeing says, how do I move continually holding you in regard when you have no regard for me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it, it's gonna take stamina and we talked about it. it's exhausting and it brings on the world wearies that is totally different than saying we need to train our kids to know how to bounce back every time right, right. and what i say is okay there is a part of that is that um yes i'm a parent i have to teach my kids that sometimes things are not going to go your way and you're going to be disappointed and how will you be resilient to that and then there's a point where i as a person who works in the system has to say why do i keep throwing things at kids that they have to recover from, that they have to bounce back from. Right. So, so there is there is an, a nuance to all of this that is different. So, right. thank you, Sheila. So, I'm going to turn to. Do we have questions from the audience? Just a couple of questions from the audience. Cool. All right. Um, audience question: Where do parents, caregivers fit into healing-centered engagement? Where do parents and caregivers fit into healing-centered engagement? Um, I, I guess I'll take it and then we can kind of riff. I mean, I think the, um, one, of the question, what I, one of the things is, is there's a way that we think about healing as a sort of one-way street that the adult provide the healing to the young person. And I think where adults, where parents and caregivers fit in is, t is that we have to think, take seriously our own healing. And so the question is, is what are we doing as parents to heal ourselves? 
what are we doing as caregivers to actually support our own sense of well-being? Are we taking care of our own mental health? So if we're not um, explicit about our own well-being, how do we expect that to translate to the well-being of the, the children that we want to care for? And so it means simply um, really making explicit the things that we do on a daily basis to actually support our own well-being. Yeah, it's well put. I, um, I think I was over-interpreting that question also to almost um, hint at something that's important to just name if, if it is a thing, just that systems um, and organ organized systems are so prone to sometimes uh, isolate their focus uh, and especially in this case, maybe uh, disregard the role of families um, or nudge the role of families aside. And, and it's something that we really need to be thoughtful of and careful about in our discussions, uh, in the way we talk about healing, in the way we talk about reimagining the way systems work. Uh, there is this tension that, um, that uh, the systems that we're all part of um, somehow not act as synergistically or supportively as embracingly and as honoring of parenting as, as they should or could. Um, so I might have been missing the part of the point of that question, but I was also hearing a little bit of that. Uh, how do we pull these together instead of um, see them as separate functioning roles in kids' lives? Great. I think that families oftentimes, it's, it's really easy to have compassion. Uh, for and empathy for, for children. And sometimes as systems, we blame parents uh, because we, it's hard to feel compassion. You're like, you, can, you, you could have done better. Or, or we assume that they don't have anything to contribute to the conversation. And, uh, and I've learned very clearly that that's wrong, that no matter what we, we might have seen one time or what, and when, what we might have heard, we have got to bring parents to the table. We've got to include, over-include, and also get to know the real stories. Let the parents tell us about themselves too, because there's a lot there. And if parents can begin healing in front of their children while we are also a part of that, then, then it just creates a connection that is, that is deep and authentic. And I think that's also interesting for social workers. Um, I, 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 I um, and, psych and therapists, right? I said, I, in some of our trainings, I say it's important for you to share what happened to you. And there's this sort of thing about disclosure. Um, in our communities, in African American, African American communities, young people, if I don't know you, you know the term young people say, I feel you? Mm -hmm. They really mean that. <laughs> And if you use your professional hat and you don't say who you are and, the, and the, what it means who you are is not just what you do for a living. It means um, when you're talking to Brian, you say, you know what, when I was 17, this would happen to me. Now, you're trained as a social worker and as a therapist not to disclose. But by not disclosing, you actually are separating your humanity from a connection for that young person. And for that young person to heal, you have to also be centered in your own humanity. And that disrupts the way in which we've been trained as therapists, social workers, and so forth. But, he, but to heal actually means that you're creating human pathways and human engagement. And it means that we have to shift right, so the, some of the ways that we've been trained to think about what really matters for well-being for young people. Um, Go ahead, go ahead. I just wanted to add, with no answers, but some complexity to the issues around um, in parent involvement and working with young people, we've also put systems in place to separate the two. Yeah. Um, now, I recognize there's good reasons for that, um, and I'm speaking as much as a parent right now as a systems person because I'm deep in the experience of raising three teenagers. I went from having total access to information about and with my young people and partnering with their providers to being cut off at 13 because of the way that our state laws work. There are good reasons for that. In fact, when I was 21, I was one of the people that helped put that in place. Um, and now, hey. <laughs> so there's good reasons for it, but there's a system in place that divides the two. So um, there's very practical things that we need to be thinking about as well when we're talking about what is parents' roles. Um, we also hold parents ultimately responsible if something goes wrong. Mm. And, and that in the context of a parent's own trauma and their own healing um, is extremely disempowering. 
So we have these sort of cultural things, we've got these legal things, and then we have the, this sort of very individual thing about where's the parent coming from and what do they have going on that, that we need to be able to talk about. It just is complex. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, there's a question, this is a question from the audience, and um, the question is to the entire panel. I know vulnerable and underprivileged are not words to use. What are respectful words to use? Words, uh, okay, that's something. Uh, uh, words are really hard, and I think that um, on the most basic level, what I would say is if you're using a word that labels somebody, that doesn't make any sense. If you use a word that describes something that somebody is living with, that that's a very different thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, I have tried very hard with Best Starts for Kids not to use any words like vulnerable populations. And then I run up against you know public health, which has a whole branch around vulnerable populations, right? So it's, um, I think we need to challenge ourselves to use words that describe, if we must, a condition that someone has either had foisted upon them or is living within and not say that that's who they, they are as a people. Yeah, you, I, you almost named it, I think, when you, were, you did, when you talked about persistently trauma exposed. Um, that might at least be a more um, apt and accurate description um, that could be in the place of that. And if I could say one more thing, we need to move away from the concept of soundbite and easily describing what we're trying to talk about with, with two words. If it's going to take 20 words, take 20 words to talk about it. Good point. Right? So we say vulnerable populations because we want to be short. Yeah. And I think, um, so I look at this question. Um, I had an experience um, some years ago training, um, what is it, teach, you guys heard of Teach for America? So Teach for America, and they're you know great organization, do great work, and we were, but these were all newly minted um, bachelor's degree white students who were working in um, Connecticut, black and brown side of town, and were catching hell. And so they asked us to come in, and we were kind of doing some training, and they were smart, man. They had all the words, they had all the vocabulary, they had all the race theor theories, and so they were like, yeah, we know that. So this question, I'm just trying to get at this question, is that sometimes it's not just the words, right? It is who is trying to communicate the words. And so if we only focus on what do I call them, but we don't work on your own awareness, consciousness, compassion, and love, then, then it, it doesn't matter what term you use. And so I want to make sure that when we leave, that we don't leave with thinking that part of the way that we solve the problem or support the healing of our young people is by using the right words. It's really engaging in our own transformation and awareness of the conditions that actually created the harm and coming from a place of love and compassion to transform them. So I just want to make sure that, you know, it's not, it's not the words that matter as much, right? Good. Um, I'm going to take a couple of more, and then I think we're, are we, okay. Um, the next question is, oh, this is a hard question. All right. It says, it says, can, I don't think it's a good question, it should be fun. Can you and another panelist briefly role play what a healing-centered conversation with a youth would look like? What are the key elements? <laughs> All right, how much time do we have? Okay, um, I'm going to give you an activity that we start with. And it is a very simple activity that opens up the ability to have conversations about our humanity. It's self-discovery. So if I have, the question came from the audience, so I'm gonna just do this. I hadn't planned on doing this, so. Um, and it's, uh, we do this and called dyads. It's a conversation, and it's just called, who are you, right? And so, I, does anybody, I can, I can do this with anyone. Who would like to? My, my brain turned off at role play. But this is actually not a role play. This is actually not introvert. a role play. So role play presumes that there's something that you're playing with, inauthentic. What we're going to do is actually real. Okay? But it's very simple. So who would like to do? Karen? Karen? All right. I am happy to put my All right. All right. So here's the kind of conversations 
that we would begin a healing circle with. It's just an activity called Who Are You? And there, there are, and we're not going to do the whole thing because <laughs> she's breathing heavy over here. <laughs> like, damn, what is going on? But it is an activity that we use to actually begin to build the kind of relationships that actually matter in healing, right? And it's, it's just three questions. But we repeat the questions over and over um, until there's some self-awareness about something. So I'm just going to ask the questions, okay? So it's called, who are you? And you could write these questions down. All right, Karen, who are you? I am a mother, a sister, a daughter. Who are you? Person, a woman. Who are you? An educator. Who are you? A member of a community. Who are you? A learner, a person who makes mistakes. Who are you? An athlete. Who are you? Um, an optimist. Who are you? A reluctant American. Who are you? An introvert. Who are you? <laughs> I see. <laughs> right. uh, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, so I'm gonna stop there. So there's three, an introvert, right? So, so what was going on for Karen is deeper reflection. She began to use her titles. I'm a, you know, director, right? And then she actually began to reflect a little bit more. And so the questioning actually allows for um, deeper reflection. The, I would have gone on, I would have asked questions about, what do others think of you? And then we would have ended with a question, who or what do you pretend to be? And that insight from that conversation, right, allows for deeper introspection. It's the mirror work that we talked about. I don't want to put you on the spot here. Who are you? What do you pretend to be? But, but that kind of, those kinds of questions, just a small activity, is a conversation that we have, not about what you do, but about who we are. And those become healing conversations with young people that allow you to build those kind of bonds and relationships that are important for transformation. My last question then is for the, for the panel is what are your dreams for young people? My dreams for young people are the same as my dreams for my daughters, and that is that they have the opportunity to be happy. I, I mean, not to take the best starts for kids language, but that's what I want my, my kids to be happy, joyful, and my kids, I mean, all kids and all the kids that I have the opportunity to work with. I want them to be happy, joyful, safe, loved. You hit me on a gut level because again, my kids came to my mind. Um, I want my kids to be, to feel seen, to feel beautiful and to feel whole. I think I want to see um, an expansion of possibility in the realms around them that they see. And then I want them to name what they dream. And I want to see that happen. Let's give a round of applause for our panel. Thank you guys very much. And thanks to the Northwest Children's Foundation. Each and every one of you, I think that we're leaving here moved, inspired. I know my thoughts are kind of a jumble. I need to process and think about it. Um, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. 
Um, the audience was amazing. Thank you so much. This, I don't think this could be replicated again. This was incredible. Um, these guys are here because last year, you guys filled out the feedback forms and said, this is the topic that you wanted to talk about. So please take a moment, fill out the, uh, the feedback forms, and just leave them on your desk, unless you're looking for the, the continuing credits, and then you'll be turning them back into the, uh, at the desk over there. Thank you so much again. Let's give them another round of applause.